Uh, g'day, welcome to Drawing the Owl episode 6, an RPG design vlog. Um, my name is uh, Sydney Icarus and I am the... Uh, I am the alpine fox of uh, the tabletop RPG community. Um, today we're talking about core mechanics and basic moves. I've been promising that we'd actually talk about designing my basic moves for like two or three episodes. This is great. I'm super glad that we're getting into it now. Um, it's a pleasure to have people with me. Um, let's get into our structure. So, um, episode six run sheet. So what I learned, okay, uh, last week we talked about move analysis and maneuver analysis I learned is all about like momentum or leverage. Um, I keep using momentum and leverage interchangeably and I shouldn't be. So let's talk about it as momentum. A 10 plus generates momentum for the player, a six minus for the GM and the seven to nine does both. The worst moves generate no momentum for anyone. And that's the um, nothing happens move. So um, we're gonna talk a lot about, um, uh, about um, how to keep momentum generated. And that's going to be really important for this thing when we get to the core mechanic. Um, what I screwed up, live chat. Live chat's not feeding in. I don't think Kyle um, sent me some things through chat apparently and it didn't pop up. So I don't know what the deal is there. I don't know if that's, maybe, maybe I need to have a different window open or something, but um, it looks like that live chat wasn't coming through to me. Uh, so apologies if you're all telling me how beautiful my eyes are. Um, so Kyle mentioned some good examples, oh, and I'll put a link to Kyle's YouTube uh, thing in the description and uh, to his Google Plus as well, because he's really smart. Um, Kyle mentioned some good things on the stake spectrum. So I said that there is a, um, there's a spectrum of stakes from like, so you got your six minus, you miss, your seven to nine, both people get a bit of momentum, and then a 10 plus generates GM leverage. Um, oh, sorry, correction, generates player leverage. And what Kyle, um made comment on which is is was very good was that um fate fate doesn't have a miss condition it just has seven to nines which is that when you miss it's just success at a cost there is like a you miss nothing happens but fate players tend to be really story driven so that tends not to come into play a lot um and games like burning wheel have just a six minus and a ten plus with the seven to nine choice being in the player's hands which is um so your seven to nine, the equivalent of a seven to nine choice would be um, you fail unless you want to spend Arthur. And then if you do spend Arthur, you succeed, you get your 10 plus condition. Um, neither of those are super interesting to me. I really like um, the the uh, PBTA version of like um, having a failure state that generates strong momentum and having a success state that generates strong momentum um, and then having the in-between choices be like pre-arranged. And I'll probably talk a lot about why that's interesting to me. Um, oh, that's an interesting comment. Bluebeard's Bride. Bluebeard's Bride has 10 pluses that feel like seven to nines um, because Bluebeard's Bride, which is really interesting. If you, if you haven't played it, it's an, an amazingly different version of PBTA. Um, Bluebeard's Bride play materials. Let's have a look at what we've got on here. So, uh, sorry for everyone who gets dizzy here. Um, okay, I wanted to talk about, I think it was the, it's the mother, I think. Is it called? The, yeah, the mother. No. Fatal. Mother, here we go. Um, this, this is like such a good 10 plus masquerading a seven to nine move, right? Which is, um, let's zoom in a little bit more for you. Uh, when a sister provokes trauma, you can step in and punish the sister who truly deserves it. Tell the guilty sister to mark the trauma instead and mark one for yourself as well as your failure to present this is self-evident. If this was a, a another, if this was a PBTA game that wanted to um, leverage a different kind of feeling, this would be a 10 plus condition. And then that would exist as a, as a seven to nine condition. Um, and yet 
uh, that is Bluebeard's Bride, which is meant to be oppressive and dark and, like, um, is meant to make you feel like you're being crushed down, uh, achieves that partially by having its success conditions, which are really its only conditions, um, be basically what would be a 7 to 9 in, in any other game. So I love that. Um, and that's something for us to think about going into our game for two reasons. One is that we'll talk about both of these later. One is that we want to maintain a struggling but not oppressive tone. And we'll talk about the difference between those because I've had some experience with that recently. And we also want to, um, we will also be hitting seven to nine more than most other PBTA games, uh, I think. Um, I'm not a good mathematician. You'll see that too. Um, refocusing design. So small attainable goals. Uh, I, I have been sitting here struggling to design. I've been sitting here struggling to, to do things on my own for the last week or two um, for a couple of reasons. Um, you know what I'll go into it because this is this that's what this this show is about. Um, one is uh, Anzac Day came up and I'm an ex service member and I have some um, some uh, like mental health issues with my service and and I have lost some some friends um, that I served with um, both uh, combat and um, mental health stuff post combat. So it's been a very difficult time for me. This is a game about war, which is do does not make that easier. The second thing is that I lost focus. I was sitting here with my YouTube videos and my Twitter account and thinking, I'm going to make something that that John John Harper follows me on Twitter. I'm going to make something and John Harper's going to pat me on the head and tell me I'm a clever little boy. And Vincent Baker's going to go on an interview and tell people that I'm the smartest PBTA designer he's ever had. And like, I just, I totally lost focus. I got so worried about the way people were going to receive what I wrote that I stopped caring about what I wrote. And it meant that when I wrote a move, which is what I'm doing at the moment, basic moves, I would look at it and say, John Harper's not going to pat me on the head for this. Um, and that is not um, a good way to design because uh, honestly, like John Harper probably doesn't pat himself on the head for his first drafts either. Like that's what first drafts are for, they're struggles. Um, but again, back to the point, this whole show is about the fact that that I didn't get to see Vincent Baker's first drafts or or John Harper's first drafts or um, like I didn't get to see Strix's first draft of Bluebeard's Pride. And that is that is a problem. Actually, that I normally do that and I didn't and uh, I feel bad about that. Um, Bluebeard's Bride, uh, there's like three or four names. So um, Strix, uh, Whitney uh, Beltran, um, Marissa Kelly, and Sarah Richardson, three excellent writers who wrote an amazing game and deserve to have their names spoken of when the game is spoken of. Um, so refocusing, it was about getting out of, out of designing for the reception. Um, it was out of, it was about you know when people make Oscar bait movies and you can see they don't really have their heart in it? That's what I started to write. Uh, I started to write a thing for kudos, not for telling a story that I wanted to tell or testing a mechanic I wanted to test. And that was a problem. So I, I brought up three things, three things that I really wanted in this game. And I, and I made this my new focus. Teamwork, a living world, and an oppressive economy. Um, I want... I want my people to work together and I want them to feel like a group, not just like individuals. I want a living world, which is that I want, I want what Blades has got with like factions and stuff. I want the world to feel like someone said it who, uh, man, I can't remember who said it, but they said that PBTA feels like the world ends outside of the player's eyesight. Like as soon as the horizon of the players ends, the world ends. And I definitely have felt that. Like my Apocalypse World things are always about what is happening immediately. Um, but I want more than that. I want I want like factions and faction status and stuff like that. Um, and an oppressive economy. I want, I want people to constantly, uh, I want the need for resources to be driving behavior. So think in D&D, &D, 
you you are not driven to go adventure. It's like mm, I want more gold so I can buy a better sword. Like of course I do. Um, I want I want people to like need to like need gold basically. Um, and so refocusing play because the important thing is once you refocus design, that needs to then move towards um, what you're actually generating. So refocusing the system, which refocuses play. So Vincent Baker once wrote it, that the um, RPGs are games and games have objects. And I don't, I don't, I don't like that. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a good thing to say, but I don't think it's an important thing to say. I don't think that, um, I don't think that the object of a game is anything but to lie. I don't think it's that helpful to be to focus on the player objective as you write. So I wrote down that the object of the game is to scrap together enough uh, to buy refuge out of the country. You need to work together, but I don't think I don't think that actual focus of play, the object of the game, is to scrap together enough refuge to get out of the country. Uh, scrap together enough to buy refuge out of the country is actually relevant to how I'm designing. I think that. I think I can take that as a player motivation, but I don't think it's really important for me to declare at this point in design. It was just an experiment I tried, um, and I I don't I haven't found it helpful or useful. Core mechanics, okay. This is some, this is this is some things that I came up with when I came up with them. Um, it actually came, it actually got um, I got inspired again. Like while I was feeling down and not enjoying this and all that sort of stuff, I sat down and I refocused myself and I said teamwork. How do I do teamwork? And so I said to myself, the aid move. I said, I said, self. I said, I said, Sydney. I said, Sydney, Eugene, Marmaduke, Icarus. Um, <laughs> Goddamn. Um, you need to write your teamwork first. If you want this to be about people working together, you need to start with your aid move. And so I thought about it. And I thought, um, we've, we've spoken about aid moves. So I'll go through this really quickly, which is that um, there's plus one, minus one, which I didn't want. And we've spoken about why I don't want that. There's a mission pool, which I was like, oh, yeah. what if you could just take out of out of the resources and then just do that? But then you obviously want to get more resources. And that's an interesting thing, but it also becomes a mathematical problem. It becomes something you can weigh up, which is problematic. And then I come up with this third idea. And this third idea sung to me and made me really, really, really happy, which is every move is the aid move. Uh, and I'll show you what I mean by that. But basically it's, you instead of writing... My first move, instead of being the move when you do things with someone, my first move was what happens when you do things without people. And this came out of, this has a small story behind it, um, which is Danger Zone. Now, Danger Zone is a game that I've put on Twitter when in its like early alpha, and I really like as a game, um, as a um, game it's basically about... Um, uh, fighters, fighter jets. Uh, as I said, I'm ex military, I'm ex air force. So I understand jets. And what I hate about games with fighters in them, what I always hate about games with fighters in them, is that um, it's. They always have like when you do something alone and like you always kind of roll independently. And the rule about fighters is that you never, ever go alone. A solo fighter is a dead fighter. It's just the way things work. So let me find uh, Danger Zone on here and we'll talk about it because this is where this mechanic came from and I really dig it. Um, so Danger Zone, and this is still a work in progress thing as well, but Danger Zone is a game of visual air combat for two players. Um, you're a fighter pilot, the other player is your wing, you're approaching a merge with a, with a baddie. And then what happens is um, when you merge, you sight the bandit and angle in. Um, whoever is higher is what's called spiked, which means that they're being detected by the enemy's radar. And whoever's lower, whoever rolls lower, is what's called clean, which means that they're not being detected by the radar. And um, the way that the way that air combat works, and I get to do my hands for this, is that each fighter only has one radar. They can only track a, a one target at a time. So, um, and eyes are the same. You've only got a limited field of view. Um, so what normally happens is um, when you get into uh, when you're in a radar fight, you tend to like one person will be targeted and the other person will try and maneuver to get into the fight. What's called undetected, like they haven't been sighted on radar. Um, the other 
thing that happens in a visual merge is that if you turn separate, so if you cut either side or you go high and low or whatever, the baddie basically has to choose who to follow. And because you can only fire out, out in front of you because of momentum and targeting and all that sort of stuff, because you can only fire out in front of you, um, whoever they follow is in a defensive position and whoever they whoever follows the baddie is in an offensive position. Um, which means that you work together. So the idea is by being defensive, you're not losing. By being defensive, you're giving someone else an opportunity. Um, and that's the idea behind being the spike jet. Um, and so that was the idea, is that you roll together and you compare your numbers. So spike jet, you're the distraction. Clean jet, you're the attacker. Um, when it comes to rolling for things, this is how I did it, which is um, if you roll, uh, so the the way it works is there's a there's a thing called um, round number, which is basically the energy of the fight. And every round, you increase the round number by one, which means that, um, and then what happens is your, your aggressive jet, your clean jet adds the round number because they're in a better position. And your targeted jet, your spike jet, um, minuses the round number because they're in a worse position because they're in that defensive position. So what happens is, uh, as a fight goes and as fighters turn, they bleed energy, which means they can maneuver less, which means they can impart less missile, uh, less energy to their missiles and lots of things um, to do with that, which means that um, all up, the longer you stay in a fight, the easier it is to die or to get shot down. Um, and so um, what what happens here in, in basic fighter dice is that um, or basic fighter dust was original name in danger zone is that um, if if you're it has to be a lower jet because your your uh, clean jet can't roll a minus one because they're always adding the number but if ever your your spiked jet rolls a minus one or lower that's it you get shot down right so what's your emergency radio call you parachute out all that sort of stuff if you roll if your your clean jet rolls an eight or higher they get a good shot off and you know you win. Um, and then in the middle, if neither of those things are true, whoever has the higher result gets something and whoever gets has a lower result gets something. So the lower result, you're predicted, you're outflown. If you were clean, you're now spiked. Um, if you're the higher result, you are now clean, which means that um, it's so much less about what you roll and so much more about the comparison between them. So the thing that someone said to me after this is... Ties should be interesting. Ties should be really, really good because you are a team and you're working together, right? So, like, you're, you're functioning, you've got flow together, you're a good team. And what I ended up coming up with um, for Danger Zone is um, a higher roll, a lower roll, a one to four tie where you're both kind of fucked and a five to six tie where things are really good. Um, and all I all I did is, if you get a one to four tie, you both pick from the lower column. If you get a five to six, you both pick from the higher column. That's all it was, and that's 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 it. That's Danger Zone's mechanic in, in a nutshell. And it turns out that is what I wanted for at the moment. That's what I want um, for forging this wall, which is that um, I I want. Uh, it has a lot of advantages. So let's let's talk about some advantages here, which is that um, this, like both players get a tie of six plus five minus was written early and it, that's kind of changed. I'm probably looking at um, five to six or five plus and four minus at the moment, um, just to open that, that um, bridge up a little bit more. Uh, and I might even go, I haven't really decided on, on whether I'm gonna go lower on that. Um, and this is our miscondition, and this is our, like, this is even better than a 10 plus, because it's even rarer than a 10 plus. So this has got to be like our 12 plus, right? We were talking before about 12 plus conditions, and, and this is that. Um, and then I mix. So that's all it is. Um, stats. And and this, this will make sense a bit more when we actually have a look at a move that I made. So stats. Um, what can we say about stats? Which is that I haven't gotten to them yet. So at the moment, I'm using a um, I'm using a collection of 
nouns for stats, basically like eyes, ears, mouth, heart. And they don't really mean anything. They kind of just allow me to group moves together. Um, there's a couple of different ways to do stats that I haven't decided on what I'm going to do yet. Uh, and I also think that stopping that in order to... Um, yeah, st stopping this design in order to figure out whether I want stats is a fucking fool's errand at the moment. So let's talk about let's talk about moves because you all want to talk about moves. I've been promising you for like a week and a half that we're going to talk about me making moves. So here's my process. But first, we have to remember that text is meaningless without context. What we are doing is only ever half the job, which is that a picture of an owl is pointless, right? Um, this is not a pipe. Uh, what we're saying instead is don't worry about perfection because this isn't the entire play experience. This isn't the game yet. This is system. And then we tag onto that setting and they inform each other. But then players tag onto that play and that informs all of it. And so what that means is that we shouldn't be sitting here and I shouldn't be sitting here being like, oh, I don't know if this move does enough of this and whatever. Because until, until the owl takes flight, until I actually see someone play with this, I won't know what it actually means. So, start in PBT. Okay, let's talk about the watch. We need to talk about the watch. Everyone, we're talking about the watch. So, um, the watch is... I don't have the watch on this computer. What the hell is going on with me? Um, I'm going to quickly re-download the watch from drive-thru while we're here, um, while we're talking. So, the watch is a game which I call... Um, I think if you consider it like Dungeons and Dragons with feelings, there's there's some good touchstones there. Uh, that's a little bit reductive. Um, basically, it's a game that l is phasic like Night Witches, but the difference is the phases are being at camp and then going out on missions. And you are, um, and again, uh, I haven't played the watch, so um, it's coming from reading the text. Um, you are you are women in this um, society that's being overrun by the shadow, and the shadow is a metaphor for patriarchy, and it's all really, really, really good stuff. Um, the watch. The watch, book and play material is brilliant. Um, so you're, you're these female um, or, or non-male um, soldiers in, uh, and you do missions and um, the game isn't about those missions. It's not about your strength and charisma and whether you stab the, um, the, the dragon in the heart or not. It's about whether you um, make close bonds with the people that you work with. The main stat is like camaraderie is like a big, is a big stat and weariness. So it's a lot and jaded as well is really big too. So it's like this interplay of, um building camaraderie with people and being weary like being overrun by just the daily grind of of being a soldier and then jaded like when you lose people and stuff right you just are we ever going to win this fight and it's beautiful it's an absolutely beautiful game and it's a game that deserves um much much more than i'm going to be able to give it in even the time that we've got here um but first things first um uh anna, anna Krita and andrew uh, Medera, uh Medirius. Uh, Anna Krita and Andrew Medirius, I think. Um, hey, if I ever speak to your name and I don't pronounce it right, give me a call. Hit me up. Just tell me I'm the worst. Um, so what we did is um, we started with PBAT move, PBTA move that I like, that does sort of what I want, which is the open up to someone. So we come here, we find open up to someone. Uh, and this isn't the first move I made. It's just a really good example of a move that I made. Open up someone. When you open up with someone, you roll with Valor. On a hit, your words and actions touch their heart. 10 plus choose two. Seven to nine, choose one. If they respond to your vulnerability with compassion or respect, they choose one for themselves as well. Okay. Um, cool things about this move. Um, open up someone is a really, really nice um triggering verb uh it's it i really like it uh, especially for my game it really it really sings to me as well which is great um if they respond with vulnerability if they respond to your vulnerability with compassion or respect they can choose one for themselves uh, which is really nice because it incentivizes compassion and respect which is just beautiful it's really it's really pleasant it's a really pleasant play experience um and then you choose uh, camaraderie, promise you something, lower your area by one, ask them what is the character thing you're at, and athletic one plus one forward. Okay, 
let's talk about um, that seven to nine scale thing that I was talking about before. Let's exclude plus one forward because plus one forward is always a nice bonus, but it's never it's never immediate. Um, these two are good resources. You want camaraderie and you don't want weary. Uh, so they both are important decisions to make. Um, they promise you something and you ask them what is your character thinking right now. This is this is gorgeous too. I am... Um, yeah, so we we find a move that does something that we like, which is this move here. Uh, that's the text that we just saw. Then we theme it to what we want, which is we we just we just strip um, the paint and throw in a new coat. Um, so for me, I was talking about like scarcity being an important thing. So my version of opening up someone is when you share what little you have. Um, when you share what little you have, roll with heart. And again, heart, whatever. On a hit, you share a tender connection. Treat uh, each other as reading a person hitting on a 7 to 9. Which, um, this for me, is this integrated into the move. I, I honestly think that what is your character thinking right now should just be part of the move. Because that is such a cool leverage generating bit. Um, if we talk about leverage here, this is the only bit... This one and this one are the only ones that actually generate leverage in the future. This is a um, recovery move, and this is the this and this are stat generation moves. Um, these two build leverage, which is why I think at least one of them should be integrated into the move. So, on a hit, you share a tender connection. Treat each other's reading a person hitting on seven to nine, uh, because I want I want my list to be bigger than just what are you thinking right now. Uh, now, interesting, interesting note for everyone keeping up. I don't know what reader person is yet. I don't know what this move is yet, but I'm already referencing it, which is um, part of my process. Like, I'm okay to, I know what this means, so I'm okay to just add it in. Yeah. 10 plus. You ask them for something they mark XP if they oblige. Um, this is Monster Heartsy, which I quite like. Uh, I like it because it generates leverage. You ask them for something. I like it because it incentivizes the connection because they mark XP. It's nice. You and they are less weary. I like that because I like it. I, I want, again, this is a, about, um, this is a game about players interacting with each other. So what I want is I want someone to say, oh, I want to share what little I have with you. And that person will be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we'll both be less weary. That sounds awesome. Again, I don't know what this means yet. Um, you can read their reactions. Treat your reader person as a 10 plus instead. This I wrote and I really like because it um, it doesn't require any extra design work. So here's, here's, a, here's a secret. Here's a secret for me. Um, the reader person and reader stitch moves are totally about player leverage generation, uh, but they also are GM leverage generation because when the player asks you a question, or asks each other a question or asks NPCs a question, they demand an answer. They beg the answer. So the perfect example is read a search, what should I be on the lookout for? Now that's player leverage generation, right? Because it's how do I get prepared for a threat? But it's also GM leverage generation because it's the player saying, give me a threat. So um, that that is why um, this is sneaky AF because a player wants to read a person on a 10 plus. Obviously, they want more. They want more questions, or they, sorry, they might want more questions. Um, in which case, it's an option. But it costs me. It co one, it costs me nothing as a, as a designer because I don't have to write anything new. It's just instead of being a seven to nine, it's a ten plus. I have done no extra design work there. The second reason is that it helps me as a designer because it says generate more leverage, make this game go faster, put your foot on the throttle of this game by picking this option that you want. If you do this, this game goes harder, which is great. Um, the seven to nine, the seven to nine list. So um, the seven to nine list, I like as well because um, you are less weary instead of them, which is all right. You tell a story over food and drink, mark off one scrap. I don't know what scrap is, but scrap is this resource at the moment. Scrap is this is this oppressive resource they don't have. But here, I've done that same fucking trick where you open yourself up, treat their reader person as a 10 plus. I'm still just generating leverage, but the player's picking it for someone else. And it's just, and oh man, 
oh man, can you imagine? Right? Um, I I want to I want to find an NPC. Right? I want to I want to find um Baz Luhrmann, the NPC. Fuck, that would have been a good one at the start of the thing. I'm definitely the Baz Luhrmann of the of the RPG community. Next next episode, Baz Luhrmann. Um, so, um, oh. Cool. I figured out how to get chat up now. So if you wanna, if you wanna chat, I got gotcha. you. Um, maybe. <laughs> um, so they go to an NPC and they're like, "Oh, I want, I want, I want to reduce my weariness, and I want to like, you know, I want to, I want to basically, um, uh." Build like take down my um, resources, and then I get to ask them a question as well. So I also get to like push the story along in the direction I want. Uh, and yeah, they'll ask me a question, but it can't be that bad, right? And then they're like, "Ah, oh, I don't want to. I don't want to tell the story of food and drink and mark off one scrap. And I'm already at zero weariness, right? So there's no point me me picking that one. What if I treat their reader person as a ten plus instead? And then I, as the GM or the G, the GM more accurately, and whoever it is, gets to look at that and be like, oh. An NPC gets to ask you three questions from the reader person list instead of just one. They're definitely going to ask you, what do you need right now? How can I get you to give me the thing that you really need? And uh, will you marry me or whatever? Like, they, they, they so are. Like, I'm, I, mm, the amount of leverage you've just given me as a GM on that 7 to 9 is brilliant. Um, and that's why that that's how retheming that move works. Um, Man, I actually didn't realize how much I did on that rather than just retheming it for you. Um, oh, the nested list problem. So we were talking about this before with um, Simple World it says don't use nested lists. That's a super valid observation. And it's one that I probably could um, uh, I probably could take on board. Um, but like again, it's a draft. This isn't about this isn't how it's gonna go out. I mean, like this, there's no reason you'd ever pick this over this, except in this, and like it's not. It's a draft. It's a draft. So mechanic shift. Then we're going to talk about this mechanic shift. This is the next thing that happens after I rethemed the move, and after I rethemed a lot of moves, I shift them into my mechanics. Uh, I really like the idea of this move being people working together, and I love the idea of players picking successes for each other. So this, this is actually a, where a lot of my coming up with this result is where a lot of the further design for this game came out of. And this was just something I like bashed out as a draft. So um, that goes to show the value, I guess, in um, just writing, just, just filling the page. Uh, so uh, I love the idea. So I'm, for example, I'm not sold on weariness as a concept. I'm not sold on taking that on, but I'm really sold on this. So like that's not valuable and that's something I can throw away. And that's a good example of, of how I'm not a good designer, like of how I made bad design, right? In that weariness might not work. It might not be what I want. In which case, terrible design, scrap it, like throw it out. But the good thing is that I found something else, which is that that open yourself up, treat your person as a, uh, read your person as a 10 plus instead, which is so nice. So I love the idea of players picking su successes for each other. I have two thoughts. It's either going to be super unsatisfying at the table because it's going to be like I rolled a seven to nine, and therefore I didn't. But but I didn't get anything for it because I I instead gave it to you. So like that's unsatisfying. But it also might bring people together where it's like um, uh, the moment in 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 Blades in the Dark, right? Where you look at your sheet, and you're like shit. I've only got like four stress left. I don't want to push myself. It's going to cost me two too stressed to push myself. I really don't want to do this. And then one of your playmates, one of your teammates is just like, hey, um, one stress, have an extra die. And you just, oh, it's wonderful. It's so, so nice to have your teammates like be there for you. And that's that's a feeling I want to generate. So just give me a sec. I took my hair out to play Blades and I regret it. Um, so this is what the move became next with my with a mechanic shift, right? Which is that when you share what little you have, you both roll with heart. So um, instead of just one person rolling, you both roll. Uh, rolling stats shifts it up a bit, but we'll ignore that for now. We, we won't talk about what these actual numbers should be, but it's basically on a hit, on a, on a 7 to 9 on a miss, right? So on a hit, 
you share a tender connection. Still the same words, still exactly the same words that I've used before. Each ask one question from the read list, um, which is a little bit more of a of a way of expressing this. Um, on a ten plus, you both choose one of of the of the list below. On a seven to nine, one of you chooses one. You open yourself up, treat their readers full success. You provide comfort for their weariness. You ask them for something they mark XP if they oblige. Now, in this in this move, we roll together. On a seven to nine, one person has the authority to pick, and one person gets the reward. So one person picks what the success looks like, and one person gets the success. I think it had to be success and not cost, because um, if one person picks the cost, the other person blames them. One of the things that the Vincent Baker said um, very early on in, in the, the design for PBTA is um, this concept of complicity. Um, complicity is a, a concept that people feel more comfortable when they feel like they have engineered their own fate, meaningfully and understandably engineered their own fate. Um, the difference is, um, there are two bridges. One of them looks really rickety and is going. it looks like it's going to collapse at any minute. The other one is big and stone, but has a giant troll on it, right? And our characters look at each other and they say, I don't really know. And our players go, you know what? I'm really good at acrobatics, but I'm not very good at fighting. So how about we go on the rickety bridge instead? Everyone agrees. We go on the rickety bridge. The bridge collapses because, of course, it does. It's Chekhov's gun. It's a rickety bridge. Um, the players then feel better if they suffer to the rickety bridge because they chose it, because they were engineers of their own destruction. They were architects of their own destruction. Um, I don't know who was the engineer or the architect of the bridge. They obviously weren't very good. Uh, so players should choose their own failure state as a rule. Um, the only... The, the breakage of that into MC moves um, is different. The MCs, um, like, <sighs> players do still choose their own destruction because soft moves should set up harder moves. So, like, the soft move happens and then the player chooses how to act and then their actions drive them. The soft move is there are two bridges, one's rickety and one's got a troll on it, and, the, and then the hard move is the bridge snaps. And so the players are okay with that because the hard move follows on from the complicity they had in the, in, after the soft move. Um, so players should choose their own failure, but can choose each other's successes. I think, I think. Again, guys, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I'm just writing a game. I don't know if it's gonna work or not. I'm just, I just, I'm doing it, all right? So um, this, is what happened next based on Danger Zone. I broke it out into two separate roles, a la, a la Danger Zone. One player gets the success, the other player gets the with cost. So that's our clean jet gets to take a shot, the spiked jet has the risk of being shot at, right? Or if you get a seven, if you if you roll a hit, both players get the yes. If a seven to nine equals you get a but or you get an and, then one gets the and and one gets the but. Um, two things there. First, lol, one gets the but. Um, second, uh, I think that that is a really cool way of like, the only issue I have with that is that you need a way to delineate between who gets the and and who gets the but. Because the issue with that, with that move that I wrote um, about one of you chooses one, is it becomes a table of a conversation. So here, seven to nine, one of you chooses one. Two issues with table level conversations. One, Powered by the Apocalypse does the negotiating for you. That's part of its beauty. That's part of why I love it. And that's part of what I want to build into it. The second thing is that um, it can't be denied that strong personalities exist in the RPG space and allowing them an avenue to force their views on another player in such a way bothers me. Um, I know you can't design for bad faith, and I know you also can't design for hot tables. So the two together is like really weird. Um, yeah.
yeah i i i would feel very bad just leaving it one of you chooses uh and i would feel very bad being like you know that you know that shit that euro board games do about like the player who was most recently in jail gets to go first or like the player who owns a red car gets to go after the player with a blue car and you just like look at the rules and you're like, are you, are you fucking like for reals man for reals um euro board games man they just disappear up inside their own assholes sometimes um i still love them i still love euro board games um so let's talk about what that looks like now here's the cool thing powered by the apocalypse rolls with 2d6 as standard 2d6 <gasps> 1d6 each let's see how that goes so that was where the mechanic moved to after that when you and a friend share what little you have you each roll 1d6 plus heart on a hit you share a tender connection each one asks one question from the read list this hasn't changed you both choose one from the higher list on a 10 plus on a seven to nine the higher result gets to ask an additional question or you give them the success you give them the you remove their weariness the lower result you are reminded of what you lost and you feel more weary so this was just me inverting these like this is you know if they ask you an additional question this, all i did was i took these two and i flipped them around to make this and that's actually a bit of a theme that i've got in this design um and not a theme that i'm stoked about because i don't think it's the most interesting way but a theme that i'm okay with um for the moment uh and i feel like a lot of this will be about a lot of pbta lists must be about um I should ask, I should ask a PBTA designer. I should get in touch with the PBTA designer and ask like how they build their lists. Um, because I feel like a lot of them are like, you make a list and then you play the game six times and you see if anyone chooses some of the options. Uh, especially when they're so fictional, like when they're not, you, you, you inflict extra harm and you take less harm is really tangible. And like plus one harm, minus one harm is really calculable. And you can see when people would pick that, but, um, you um you lose something dear to you and you offer someone else an opportunity are not tangible right so there's no uh, there's no actual way to decide uh, empirically mathematically when players would pick one over the other ties ties was the next thing so the problem is when you're rolling two dice and you're saying higher or lower Garen fucking tell you someone's going to roll a tie. And when they do, you don't want to do Euro board game trash, man, which is the player who plays the younger character always gets the low roll. Because you know what? You know, you know what? I know RPG players. Someone's going to play fucking twins. So we had a couple of options. To see what this is to see what these actual numbers were, what a 10 plus and what a seven to nine meant. We need a full success, a full miss, and a mix with higher and lower. So there were three options. Um, three options is um, a success result is a total of 10 plus, and that means that player stats are probably going to be about plus one ish, right? So you're probably going to have a plus one to minus one, maybe minus two um, range of stats. A mix is a total of seven to nine, a mix is six minus. Okay. Option two doesn't combine the results. Option two is like what um, what Danger Zone does. Uh, the highest roll greater than eight, lowest roll greater, uh, less than a two. Um, that should probably be greater than or equal to or whatever. Um, the issue with this, and I have seen it happen in Danger Zone, is what happens if you get both at the same time. Um, if we get a success and a miss, does that mean we get both conditions? Um, and there's no satisfactory answer to that. There is no answer that, that feels satisfying as a player for that. Option three is um, involves ties, which is that a success is a tie that's greater than or equal to five, uh, a mix is anything else, and a miss is, is a tie that's less than or equal to four. Um, the thing about option three, and this is this is where um, 
this is where my inability to do maths actually becomes a problem. Uh, and I did go on the gauntlet slide and Yoshi really helped me out, um, but I didn't find a satisfying answer, um, unfortunately, despite all the excellent work that he, that he went to, which is that, um, because it doesn't, I can't tell what it's going to feel like. Um, high ties are going to be pretty rare. Like ties are rare. Ties are a one in 36 chance if you're rolling 1d6 each. That's it, one in, th one in 36. The chance of getting a success with no stats, a full success, a full smash out success with no stats in PBTA is about 20%, 15%, 16.67. .6, I say off the top of my head, like I don't have it literally written on the screen in front of me. 16.66 um, .6 repeating percent that you will get a full success with no stats. Um, in option three, in that ties option, with no stats, your chance for full success is less than 10%. I think it's like 5.56. What's um calculator? What is one on 36? Uh, no, that feels bad. That feels bad. 2.7 repeating percent chance of a success to get a tie. Um, and that's... Um, <sighs> ah, it's not actually that bad. It's about 5% because we don't care if it's a 5 or a 6. And the higher stats go, the higher that percent gets. Only just because there's a five and a five and a six and a six does it. And then if you have plus one, it's seven to seven and an eight and an eight for plus two does it as well. So um, you can, you get up to 5%. I think you get up to like 10% with, with both having a plus two in the stat kind of thing, chance to, to get a, a tie above five. Um, that's, that's not great. Um, and then your miss, your miss chance is um, a little bit bigger, right? Um, it's actually how many options do we have one two three four and then it's one in 36 chance right so it's um sorry that's um that's about a 14 percent chance which means that that most of the time we're going to be sitting in a seven to nine method so so which means one important thing, and I've written it here because it is a key design prospect here. I either need my, my to change my method, or I need my middle results to be really fucking interesting. That's it. Middle middle results have to be really interesting, or I did my math wrong, which is a possibility. Um, and that's why I didn't show my math because I'm not entirely sure. Thing. Okay, um, option four of individual results says that a success is both die being over five and a fail is both die being under four. Um, there are two options to this. One is that um, is that this generates more successes, which is kind of fine, and this generates more failures. It's a bit more linearly affected by, um, by uh, uh, stats and a bit less um, curvy, which is fine. Um, the... The big issue is that one thing I want to do is I don't want to limit it to two. So imagine you, uh, it's kind of like a blades group. No, it's not like a blades group action at all. When you want to help someone, you don't, you don't help. You just all do the move together. And so um, if you've got two people doing a move, you roll 2d6 and add your stats. And if you get a tie and higher and lower and tie, all this sort of stuff, if you have three people doing the move, if you have a group of three people doing things together, you just roll 3d6 and you just pick which one not to have. It's like having um, advantage in uh, Impulse Drive, I think, does advantage. I think Impulse Drive does advantage. Um, so, uh, and then and then um, 4d6, if you have four PCs, or if you have five PCs, you get to roll 5d6 all working together and you get to pick your best two dice. Now, that sounds big, right? And it, and it kind of is, and that will kind of fuck with your economy if you only ever get PCs one front to fight on. But the hope is that there's enough resource drain that, like, bigger groups have to do more and can't can't afford to, like, just go around together and just just face roll shit. Um, I, we spoke about during the Aid Moves episode that I wanted 
uh, aid moves to pull double duty. And that's a really good example of, to me, of um, what I want of my aid moves to do, which is that the act of helping someone doesn't trigger a different move. It just changes the move that you're triggering. Uh, in this case, by letting you roll an extra d6 um, and and pick the best one. Now, the issue is um, this changes your chance of ties in like a really different curvy way. Again, not a maths dude, but I would say like um, rolling 2d6 and getting a tie on one of them is a 1 in 30. Well, it's not 1 in 36 chance. It's a 1 in 6 chance because you don't care what the first die rolls, right? So um, it's one in six chance you'll get a tie with two players. It is a, what's that, two in six chance that you'll get a tie with with two players? Because you don't care about the first. Yeah, so it's like a two in six chance, right? So one in three. I don't fucking know if this is right. Um, but the point is that, that it increases that really well. And then a four in, or three in six chance of, of getting a tie, which is really, really cool because it means that it both increases your chance of going out the top and succeeding, and it increases your chance of going out the bottom and failing, which is great. It's great, um, but it does mean that if you did roll a fail, you'd probably just pick the other die, right? So, so it doesn't increase your chance of failing, it decreases your chance of failing, which I'm fine with. The chance of failing in this game is fucking so low that I need my seven to nines to generate a lot of leverage. And that's what I mean. That's what I mean when I say interesting. When I say interesting, I don't mean for the players. I don't mean attractive, although that's very true. I need it to, to generate leverage for both sides. So momentum, 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 leverage, leverage, leverage. That's what this game has to be about in this design phase. So let's talk about moves. Let's let's actually get to it. It's been about another, what, how long have we gone? Like 20 minutes? Half an hour? Um, yeah, so uh, what have we gone for? Yeah, almost an hour. Oh, fucking hell, almost an hour. God damn. Um, so let's talk about my actual moves. So what I want people to do things together, yep. So um, this is all genre stuff. This is all stuff I want, I've thought of genre wise, right? I want people to listen to the radio and ask for news of others and read messages of paper. I want fiction interrogation. I want people to like, to, to, to search for news from weird locations, right? Um, I want trade, um, but I don't know how I want that to, represent, to manifest yet. I want people to manage wounds. I want people to get wounded. And I want people to treat wounds. So I want um, people to get wounded and treat a wound. Uh, I want fucking, I want cuddling, I want spooning. I want to, people to reflect on loss. I want people to share their backstory with each other. Uh, I want people to share. Now, this, this term I've already used in that move up ahead. I fucking love this. I think this is such a good term for what I want in this game. Share what little they have. Mm. Mm. So this low barrier intimacy, one of the things that was really important to me is um, I really like sex moves. I, re I think that sex moves in almost every game are really interesting because they're about connections between characters. They almost always have, um, they have like three different types, which is that uh, there's either you get something, they get something, or you both get something. And it's... Um, and in each of those, there's kind of this subtype about whether it costs the other person. So, for example, the witch's, um, the witch's sex move or intimacy move in uh, Monster Hearts is you get a sympathetic token of them, they know about it, and it's cool, which is implies a couple of things, um, but mostly implies that, like, you get something, but it doesn't cost them anything. Or it does cost them something. It costs them, you, it costs them your leverage over them. Um, the sex move for... Um, the brainer is that you get to read someone. So you get that, and that's super cool. Their sex move for um, the gun lugger is you give someone plus one forward, I think, which is, like, cool. It's 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 this really interesting thing because it motivates the gun lugger to fuck everyone, right? So um, intimacy, intimacy moves are interesting to me because intimacy between characters is interesting to me. And so I want a really low barrier on what intimacy means. Because the thing I hate about uh, Apocalypse World or about um, Monster Hearts or about Urban Shadows is that like, sometimes sex just doesn't come up and that's fine. Like I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying I want to start my games and just start fucking 
burning away. What I'm saying is um, sometimes it's not right. It's sometimes we don't zoom in on those moments. Um, and so players feel like their intimacy move never comes up or their sex move never comes up. And the problem is that use of that term sex move, which is why uh, I think a pocket, I think a monster hearts calls it intimacy move. Um, someone calls it intimacy. Uh, and that's a really good change as well, right? Because it, um, no, monster hearts two calls it a sex move. It must be urban shadows or something. Um, and the thing about, Man, if you're the designer, if you ever see this and you're the designer that called an inst intimacy move first, get in touch with me because I want to fucking pat you on the back. Um, calling an intimacy move changes it because it lets it lets players scale. It lets the table scale what they want intimacy to be, which is um, it can be touching hands. It can be kissing. It can be fucking. It can be a soft glance in a quick moment. You know, you're on the battlefield together. And the enemy's out there and you're like, they will never take our freedom. And then one person says, I turn my head and I lock eyes with Sandra D. And a current jumps between us. That's an, in that's an intimate moment. Intimacy move. Fire that shit off. Like, PBTA should never be about not firing off moves. You should never be looking for an excuse not to make a move as a player or a, or a GM. Um, so... Share what little you have presents a really cool low barrier to intimacy for me, and we'll talk about that when it comes up. Um, I also want people to... Um, so I said touch fire, but then I need to say literally because I really don't want this to turn into an act under fire move. Um, I mentioned before that I don't want... I don't want um, act under fire moves because I think that they... Um, not necessarily a lazy, but I think that they um, present. I think that they present negative space in a game design that benefits from not having negative space. If that makes sense. Um, I'm playing Blades in the Dark at the moment, and a large part of Blades in the Dark is about um, negotiating position and effect. And it's amazing. It is so obvious how out of line some people's shared imaginative spaces are when you're like, um, so any, an example, and um, like Kyle, if you're, if you're watching this, I, I love it. And, and we and we worked around it really well and it, and it went excellently. But I'm imagining my character having this like big fucking heaving pistol, right? And a guy dives me and I'm like, I hit him in the head with the pistol. And um, Kyle, who's jamming, is like, yeah, that's, um, that's, uh, well, desperate situation and limited effect. And that that showed a disconnect because I was like, I'm hitting him in the head with a fucking, with the, the base of this of this Blades pistol, right? Which Blades in the Dark is like big breech loading, like heavy muskety type pistols, right? Um, black powder shit. So I was thinking like great effect, like out for the count. And then we negotiated around it. Oh, what if I shoot him in the leg instead? Will that like get, get me to where I want to be. And yeah, absolutely. And we, and we did, and that was great. And I was really, really happy with it. Um, but that doesn't happen in Powered by the Apocalypse because moves have boundaries, because the negotiation has been done by the system. I'm not saying it's better. I'm saying it's what I want to design. Uh, and it's better. No, um, it's what I really enjoy playing because, because that negotiation tells me as a player what to do and what to expect. And I like a bit of guidance. Um, but that's me. And that's why uh, dodge fire needs to be a literal, not an act on the fire. I want people to starve, struggle, and go without. Um, I need a move that's like when you have to consume a resource, but you can't, something bad happens to you, right? That is a, that, that's something I need, and I don't know what it's going to look like. Ooh, conduct a ritual of the old world. So I want people to do things like um, to play Monopoly and to... Um, uh, I want people to, to do funerals and I want people to throw weddings and I want people to like, oh man, can you imagine? Can you imagine, right? Um, you're in the middle of a war. There's bombs going off outside. You're scrounging every day just to get enough to eat. And two people like share a bed because they're sharing what little they have. They only have one bed between them. So they like curl up and they like huddle next to each other. And they're like in the cold of this like winter war they fall for each other and six sessions later they like 
approach one of the PCs and like, hey, like, can you marry us? Like, I, I, I know you used to be a priest or like, I, you know, you're the closest thing we have to a priest around here. Can you marry us? And I, I want that. I want that scene. I want, I want that. That's so fucking cute. And when someone dies, when someone starves or gets shot or whatever, I want them to bury them and I want them to care and I want them to, to eulogize and I want them to like, so, so like, a ritual of the, I'm calling it the old world or like before the war or something like that. But like, I want, I want them to do things that have no place in war because these, this is a story about people who have no place in war. Um, so we mentioned before in the last thing that there's like permissive and, and dismissive, uh, permissive and restrictive, um, moves and one of the versions of a restrictive move is i want a move that's like when you try to sleep alone like when you are alone in a room and you try to sleep you have to make a role because what that says to people is that you are not meant to be sleeping alone you are meant to be with other people you should not like yeah and i, th I think that's and i'm so hesitant to make a move about like when you sleep because uh i want that to be consumed by share what little you have. Um, oh, interesting, interesting. You should see this as as a broadcast about shit that I do wrong. Um, this is interesting. I still haven't figured this out. And maybe we'll talk about it today. Um, threaten, withhold, uh, declare. So like I mentioned that Powered by the Apocalypse games have a thing that's like when you demand what you want or when you like give people violence to get what you want. And I don't know if I want that. I don't know what that looks like for me yet. And I don't know if I want that because I don't want these to be characters that are defined by violence. And I think if I do do it, I want it to be really rough. Um, when you make a promise is kind of a move that I, like these these responses here, are things that I stole from um, the Dogs in the Vineyard PBTA hacker I was doing. Um, I, like, I like make a promise being a move because I like, uh, I think people... I think players tend to make promises a lot. And I think that they're a little bit, um, I, th I think that a move helps guide that. Um, lose people to death and abandonment. That's kind of covered by that ritual thing, right? Which is like um, ritual of the old world. Um, yeah, uh, screw it away. So one of the things I want to do is have this like competing economy drain of like the the safe house the community the people that we have together needs um scrap needs food water medicine whatever scrap um but i need it because i'm gonna trade it to get my own trip out like i'm gonna i'm gonna use i'm gonna put it in my stash to like get the fuck out of here and so it's about um it's like mixing it's challenging the self versus the community you know at what point are you more important than everyone else um because you ha you have to you have to get out of the wall you're not going to survive this um but if you don't if you but if you do get out of the wall you might be doing other people to like struggle without you Right. Um, so one of the first moves I wrote um, is this one, when you don't do things together. So remember I said that uh, I wrote the aid move first. Well, this is, this, is, this is my equivalent of an aid move in my game, which is um, the, <laughs> the opposite of the aid move. Um, so when you don't do things together, you roll your half of the move as normal. On an eight plus, you get the higher die result. On a five to seven, you get the lower die result. On a four minus, you miss. Um, I like this because it says that you can't really succeed on your own, but you might, you might just maybe be able to like scratch through. Uh, eight minus might be too high. We'll talk about that in the future. Again, like these bits, eight minus five, seven, four minus, um, are the least important things. You'll see when I do like other moves, I just call them like smash, smash, high, low, and miss. Uh, and I think that getting tied up in what these numbers are is going to kill me. Um, NPCs, this is an interesting one. This is, this is one we can talk about now, which is what, what happens when you do things with an NPC? Should an NPC function as 
a PC. Basically, what this is saying is, um, if you if you go searching, and it's just you and another and an NPC. If if Marco says, "I know where to find some good scrap," and leads you out there, should you roll alone, or should you roll? Should Marco roll plus nothing? It's a good question. The problem is that I don't like the GM then having choices that players would normally have because it runs into this issue of like the authority. Like, does um, does the GM say what honesty demands, or does the GM say what the um, what the pacing of the game needs? So, I'll show you an example. We'll find a move. We'll, we'll do an example. Um, Mm, what's an example I want to show you? Um, cool. Let's do Scrounge Through Rubble because it's there's like six versions of it, but let's just pick one. So uh, when you Scrounge Through Rubble, you roll plus nose. Smash. So on a full success, you find a bunch, plus you get something else, which generates momentum. By the way, this is what all of my moves look like at the start. It's just, oh, you find, uh, let's, I'll show you that really, really, really quickly. It's fucking great. Um, so this is the move when you listen out for good news, and this is what the original thing looked like. Uh, uh, I'll find it. I'll find it another time. Um, I want to finish talking about this first. Um, boy, if you ever had any idea that I had, didn't know what I was doing, you could just watch these videos, couldn't you? Um, so scratch the rubber roll plus nose. On a smash, you find a bunch. It's great. On a high high roll, when you're the higher roll, you find some valuable scrap and you choose one. You can get some interesting information. You find some high quality shit. You find a specific thing you need. Um, on a low, you choose one. You catch the glint of a scope or the sound of a gun cocking. You can't fit everything in your bag. You ignore the signs someone else owns it. Cool. Or you leave evidence that you were the ones that took it. Both of those are good. Um, the issue is, let's let's look at these. Let's say the GM is the high roll. Right, so I go with Marco. My nose is plus one. Marco rolls plus zero. He gets a six. I get a three, which pushes up to a four. Right. I'm the I'm the GM. I find some valuable scrap. Okay, so they're going to get plus two scrap, and I choose one. Hmm. I know that they really need this one thing. Right. They really need a radio. They're so they've got everything they need but a radio. Um, and then you, you know, mm, but I want to give them a piece of information. So I pick this one and the players like gritting their teeth and being like, come on, man. Like we wanted that specific thing. And, Ma and Marco knows that we want a radio. Like, how is this fair? How is this fair that Marco doesn't find a radio? Um, that's what the NPC wants. So you should make the choice in accordance with what the NPC wants. But the GM might say, no, I'm making the choice in accordance with what my story demands, like what what pacing demands. Um, and maybe that's, maybe it's good. Maybe it's good that people don't like it, that, that it's like, oh, NPCs are all right, but they're not great because like when they get the higher one, they just choose whatever the MP, whatever the GM wants. They don't choose what we want. So maybe that's okay. Maybe that's okay. Talking out loud, and this is one of those times where I start talking, I don't know where it's going to end up. Talking out loud, the issue with providing NPCs so much agency is that it can turn into the GM playing with himself a bit. Like, oh, yeah, okay. So um, you catch a glint of a scope and then this happens and like feed right into it. Whereas remember... Players want to be... Yeah, so that's the thing. That's the thing. It's not about the success isn't the problem. It's the low one that's the problem. If the GM picks the low one, the players aren't complicit. If the GMs pick the low one, the, the, the players are not... Um, 
are not complicit in their own destruction. I, as the GM, have picked the Glen of Escope, which means... Which means that what that says is when you act with an NPC, if you roll high, the GM also makes a move. Makes the move that follows. If you roll low, the GM will be kind, will make a soft move that follows, right? Hmm. Maybe that's okay. Maybe it's rewarding enough that players will be okay if they have to do it. And maybe it's detrimental enough that players will not want to do it. Interesting question. Very interesting question. Hmm. Um, if anyone's got any ideas on that, I can chat's open. My Twitter's open. Let me let me actually bring up my Twitter. Um, yeah. Hit me on that particular shit because I don't have an answer for that at the moment. Um, let's talk about um, sharing what little you have again. If you guys don't mind, because it's um, I want to talk about it before we before we move off this move. Because I wrote one other version of it. Um, when you and a friend share what little you have, roll plus heart. On a smash, everything is better shared. Rest, and then the next time you roll with each other on a mix, you both get the high result. Um, I don't like. Uh, I need to stop using italics for that. Um, I don't like tracking. I don't like the fact that you need to track when you next roll with each other, but I do like the idea that the next time you roll, you both get the high result. I like it, but I don't know how to do it without without having without having a tracking thing. I don't want to. I want to get away from writing things down on character sheets, basically, because I want the character sheet and the moves to be a prompt, um, not to be administration. Anyway, hi. Choose one to ask the other character. What do you like most about me? Where do you see yourself after the war? What can I do to make you happy? Very positive, right? Very positive, flowery questions. Low, choose one to ask the other character. Will you regret this later? Does this mean more than we're pretending it does? Who would you rather I was? Very like destructive questions. I really like that too. Um, I wish I wish I could. Um, I'm just going to quickly put the other version that's up the top with that version because it does they deserve to be together because uh, the other one i think might be a little bit better um or not a little bit better but like might have uh, a different way of looking at it um by the way i don't know if i mentioned it but again these this google doc that all this is on is in the description of this video or should be yeah it is oh so you can read along um Cool. Uh, that scraps through rubble, which means that it's above that. And I wrote so many different versions of scraps through rubble, didn't I? Um, share what little you have. Okay. So that's that version of share what little you have. Um, let's talk about another move that I wrote that I actually want to do some work on. Um, uh, actually, I will say that I started with my fiction interrogation, which probably is not the best way to do it um, for future PBTA designers. Starting with fiction interrogation is really good because it lets you decide, because uh, that's where players are going to start. So remember, something needs to generate momentum to, to start your game. Um, players are probably going to start with f fiction interrogation or by the opportunity that you present them. Uh, so that was where I wanted to start. And I'm not sure that's the best way to do it. Um, so when you and a friend listen out for good news, tell the MC what you're looking, what you're hoping for, and then both roll 1d6 plus ears. On a smash, you get some news about what you'd hoped to get news about. Ask the GM a question each. You can ask whatever question you like. On the high roll, you're the good news. Choose one. What nearby is useful valuable to me? What's really going on here? What should I be on the lookout for? What's the best way in my way through? And how can I get blah to do blah? On a low, there's bad news. Choose one. Who's been asking around about us? What's this going to cost us? What danger is approaching? Who else is interested in what we're listening out for? Um, those of you who are astute uh, viewers will notice that um, this here, 
I stole from other games. This is there's nothing new in this. Um, and the reason I stole them from other games is because they're functional. And my plan is when I hear different questions or when a player says, oh, instead of one of these, can I ask this question? I might add it to the list because that's fine. But it, they, these are this is a functional list. I can play test this list. Um, I actually started with what's useful available to me because this is a game about scarcity and resources, right? Um, the thought, the double question marks here, um, which actually deserves to be in an editing double asterisk, um, is because this is actually a bit of a, this is a bit of a, there's bad stuff coming question. Like this generates momentum for the GM, which is really the purview of the lower roles, not the, not the higher roles. Um, low, and then there's bad news, choose one. So these are all, these are all new. Um, this is basically a rewrite of what should I be on the lookout for. Um, this is kind of a rewrite of who should I be on the lookout for, which is really interesting. Um, what's this going to cost us is a great question because it implies there will be a cost and it. Oh, I just, I just really like it. I'd like my players to ask that. Um, who has been asking around about us? This is a bit of a, this, the problem with this is it's a little bit dissociated. I didn't actually notice this until we we're just talking about it now, dissociated with the move. And what that means is that, um, see this one, who else is interested in what we're listening out for? That's, that one is fed by the move. Um, you listen out for something, someone else is interested in what you're listening out for. This is kind of like, uh, I guess it could be like if you were um, if you were talking to someone, if you like asked them, hey, have you heard any news about Marco? Uh, I heard he went scrounging and then you roll the move and they're like, oh, yeah, Marco, is he with you guys? Someone's been looking for you. Um, so maybe, maybe not, maybe not associated with them. And by move, I kind of mean fiction of the move. Um, and I'm not sure whether or not it is. But yeah. Hmm. Um, Oh yeah, this is what this is what I was talking about about having um having a move just like smashed out right. So when you listen for good news, tell them what you what you're hoping is about. What you're hoping is about. What you're hoping about. What you're hoping of. And then both roll. Um, when I hit you, get some news. Ask a question. Ask a question. Choose one of these. That's a bad question. MC move. That this is what it looked like originally, right? This, this is this was my first draft of the move. And I think you can see that um, its DNA is still in here. Um, and it means that this is not, I think I, I think I mentioned to you before about intentionality, which is that I don't want to, uh, I can't just put something in a move and be like, it's there by accident. Um, nothing, nothing that I put in this should be by accident. So when I say ask the GM a broad question, that is specifically designed to be a beneficial arrangement. I had it in my draft. I chose to remove it once. I left the other one in. It's intentional. And that's uh, a really important design philosophy for me, which is that we're doing things intentionally. So, um, yep, that was what that first draft looked like. I don't really dig it. Oh, this is cool. I just, I just took a list of all the reader persons that I was interested with, right? So this is Night Witches. This is oh that's night witches. What's your character? What's your character's beef with? Is that? I think that might be the watch. Might be something else. Urban shadows maybe. Oh, that's urban shadows I think. Um, and then I don't know where that's from. Um, but I just like got a, got I got a list together and then I just picked out the ones and you can see the DNA of those in here, which is great. Um, I actually these build into the reader person one that I made next uh, much more. So when you read a person, roll plus eyes. Between you, ask two questions from the list below and any one additional question you like. So this is kind of interesting because I said before I didn't want people to have to like pick. And so maybe, maybe I don't like this. Maybe I don't like the fact that you can only ask one additional question, which means that um, uh, the players have to choose um, should rewards have to be divvied like this? Oh, that's a word. That's a word, Google Docs. Shut up, it's divvied. Higher roll, ask one of the list below. Lower roll, ask one of the list below. They will ask one back to you. So this is um, uh, an intent to get away from nested lists. 
So one of the problems I started coming up with more and more and more is that um, I have a list for high roles and I have a list for low roles. I have a list of good things and I have a list of bad things. And the reason I can't put them together is because the high person needs to feel like it's fundamentally a success. But the low person's responsibility is to generate momentum. If I put them together, I feel like they'll both feel unsatisfying. But if I if I make it, if I make, sorry, if I have a single list, they'll probably both feel unsatisfying. Um, so I'm struggling and I'm struggling at the moment how to do that reader situation move, um, listen out for good news without, without, um, without having to divide my good stuff and my bad stuff. And the way that I've kind of come out to that is that both players get something and they get to pick from the same list and they both get good things, but the lower roll has a cost. But that cost needs to be pretty huge to really generate momentum. This one's different because as we've said a couple of times now, read a person generates momentum on both sides. Um, it's my secret move. It's my, it's my favorite move. I don't know how Monster Hunts did it. I don't know how uh, Dungeon World did it. Well, that's not, that's not true. I understand. Dungeon World generates momentum by um, being a dungeon fuck, right? Like that you, that you go out and you do things. You have to do things, right? So like um, uh, Monster Hearts is about external pressures. Um, Apocalypse World um, is a lot about ex uh, like internal drive goals that are really like immediate um, and... Dungeon World is about, like, you normally have, like, a quest. Like, I think Dungeon World kind of needs a functional... Not needs. I think Dungeon World benefits from a functional quest. Um, so, read a person in games like this, in, in sandbox games, for want of a better term. That is such a bad... It's such a bad way to put it, but I'm going to say sandbox games because you know what I'm talking about when I say that. Um... Read a person is effective in sandbox games because it drives momentum on a success, a uh, miss, or a middle result. Um, and it just drives so much momentum in both directions, which I love. So let's talk about what questions I picked. Because I mentioned before that like, I just put up a list of questions from different games that I liked. Um, what does your character want from me? What's your character's most immediate need? What's your character worried might happen? What's your character intend to do? There's, there's nothing. This is this is all, even this is nothing. This is, I think, the only one I wrote, which is what's your character leaving unsaid between us? And the reason I did this is because I'm going for that intimacy target. So this is designed to um, momentum equals intimacy. There's a T in momentum these days, momentum. Um, that's all this is, which is that what is your character leaving unsaid between us can be anything from he's got a gun under the table to he has, that's not a gun in his pocket, right? Like, um, what is your character leaving unsaid between us? I think is a great question. And I, actually, it's a question I really want to be asked more. Not, not because putting a fine point on that stuff is important, but because subtext is so hard in RPGs sometimes. Um, Scrounge Through Rubble. We spoke about Scrounge Through Rubble. This is at least one version of it that I'm really happy with. Um, so as I said, smash, find a bunch, plus something, generate some momentum. I have no idea what this looks like yet um, because I, I feel like this is reliant on understanding the economy. But I know it's got to be super good. That's all I know about it. Um, you can piece together interesting information. Now, I do a thing. I do a thing that I don't know how many other people do. But it's basic. What it basically is is you know how in apocalypse world, how you get shot, and then you um, character sheet demo, coach, uh, playbooks thunder. You know how in apocalypse world how you get shot, and then you're like, now that you've been shot, you have to roll the harm move. I love moves that trigger moves. I wrote this thing in um, in the Dogs Power by the Apocalypse version I was doing, um, and you, there's so much there's so much backend stuff in here that you're not going to understand, but it's totally okay. Um, I wrote this move um, called Spend a Quiet Moment in Prayer and Ritual, and what I like about it is that um, 
man, I need a cough button. When you spend a moment, quiet moment in prayer and ritual, um, on on the eleven plus, which is actually the the miss the the success with cost result thing, right? You clear your stress track, and then you feel the influence of demons. Now, feel the influence of demons ain't fucking around. It's it's its own move. So feel the influence of demons when you when you 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 miss on that move or when you seven to nine on that move you get what you want but then you have to roll this move which is a shitty move to roll and on a seven to nine when you would when you would roll uh a miss or actually uh yeah when you would roll a miss but instead you pull out a piece to press the point when you pull a gun on someone you escalate first take one stress then re-roll the previous move with plus six and then feel the influence of demons which is like um i love moves that trigger moves because i think that pbta moves should be interlinked and i think they should fictionally feed into each other and so my intent it's not it's not design yet but my intent is the opportunity for if a if if a gm wants to generate momentum you find some valuable scrap and you can piece together some interesting information and then the gm basically says oh well um like i'm gonna put this in double records because it's not something i actually want as as scripture but i want as, as an option um Roll the um, listen out for news roll. Or get news, I guess. Roll the get news move. And what that does is it packs into this little choice, into this one sentence, uh, it packs a shitload of game, of system. And the other thing it does is it doesn't mechanize it. So it doesn't say you can piece together some interesting information, ask one question of the GM or like ask a question from the news move or whatever. It just says you can piece together information. And then the GM says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, um, I don't know what particular information you'll find there. So why don't you roll the get news move instead and we'll figure it out from there. Alternatively, if the GM knows, if what honesty and prep demands says that the GM, uh, look at me talking like I have fucking GM principles. If what honesty and prep demands says that the that they know what they find, the get news move doesn't need to apply because you just get the news. You don't need to roll. You just get the news. It's not it's not a moment of drama. Um, it's the same with with high quality shit. Like I don't know what high quality shit's going to be yet. Maybe maybe high quality shit should just be like plus two extra scrap, right? But I want that to be. I want that to be in the GM's hands. I want pacing, right? So imagine, imagine your group, you're doing real well. You've got like nine scrap and it's only going to cost you three to eat in the morning. So you're like, you're feeling good, right? You've, you've got this, this really, um, this is something I talked about in the sprawl too. Like you've got this real lack, you're fucking riding high. And then you pick high quality shit. And it says on the sheet that that's plus four scrap. And the GM's looking at the sheet and he's like, fuck me running. How, how, how do you have like, what's that? Like 13 scrap now? Like this is balls. My pacing of the game is fucked. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to push your buttons so hard. But instead, if I say you find some high quality shit, what I do is I put, I put in the GM's hands the ability to execute pacing. Um, and this is what I was talking about before about Words without context, text without context is nothing about the, the drawing of the owl. Je ne cause ça pipe. Um, uh, Pour que no los pipe. Um, if I tell them what it means, it means I don't trust them. And sometimes that's okay. Sometimes it's good not to trust them because I can't... If I went on Twitter now and said, hey, I'm writing a game about being survivors, scavengers in war, please play, like, go now. The rule is when you roll a tie, it's good. When you, it's good and bad. Like, that's it. I can't trust people to play that. But I can trust people to decide whether plus one scrap or plus five scrap is a big thing. Especially because, um, fictionally, the difference between uh, we're scrounging in this house or we're scrounging in the police station, right? And if your if your PCs are like putting themselves under fire and they're running the sniper lines and they're sliding under doors and they're like whoa, 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 run 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 and they're like uppercutting bounces and they're like headbutting snakes and they're like 
ah, bombs are going off and it's behind them and they're like walking away from the explosions with sunglasses and shit and they're, they're like putting themselves under hard pressure and rock and danger. You find some high quality shit plus one scrap. Fuck that noise. That noise there is particularly fucked. What about instead you find some high quality shit? What is that? What is that? You know, like maybe, maybe that, I don't know. And then you find the specific thing you need is really cool as well because um, I don't want to talk about advancement yet, but it's in my advancement thing that they're going to want specific things. And, and it's, it's fictionally driven and it's so wonderful. And like, it's, I want them to start with so little and then they have to get like a heater and they have to build a, they have to build more beds and like all that sort of stuff. And like, I want that. I want, I, I want them to need specific things. And that's going to be such a big choice because you're going to have to choose between, man, we are behind. We are behind on, um, on, on scrap. We need it so that we can eat tomorrow. But I just rolled this, this scrounge roll and I can find us a radio. Like I can do it. Do I want a radio or do I want, to eat tomorrow and that's that's the question of forged in this war right um the low ones you catch the glint of a scope or the sound of a gun cocking um i mentioned before that i don't want players to execute violence but i do want violence to be executed against the players but i want it to be fucking scary i want i want violence to suck i want it to be i'll show you my my equivalent of the harm move and it fucking bites if you roll it you will it, it's it's bad times and it's because I want, I don't want it to be like a blade of hit points, right? Like, uh, I just keep ticking around until my clock's at 12 and I don't dig that. And I also don't like, um, I don't like the way that, um, that it, uh, I don't mind the way that blades does harm with like, you lose capability as you get harmed. I actually, I actually like that a lot. Um, We'll talk about harm move later because I really do want to. Uh, Lo, you can't fit everything in your bag. That's an interesting one because that is very specific as well. Um, so that's that you can't fit everything in your bag is um, the GM will offer you a hard bargain or an ugly choice, right? Which is, um, yeah, you found some specific thing you need. It's it's the radio. You found the radio you need. Unfortunately, you can't fit the radio and the scrap. Pick one. You're going to have to leave something behind. Um, and then the last one is you ignore the signs that it, someone else owns it or you leave evidence that you're the ones that took it. That is that living world thing we were talking about. So remember, we're going back to our design principles. Um, so remember our three design principles were teamwork, economy, living world. This move has teamwork because you have to roll it together to do well at it. Uh, it has a living world because um, you ignore the signs that someone else owns it implies that there's like there's a world out there. I might, I might actually leave, change the the move to be like, you don't leave evidence. That, uh, no, you leave evidence. You leave evidence that you were the ones that took it. Yeah, absolutely. You leave evidence that you were the ones that took it. Um, because that's going to be good. And um, and then the the economy bit, the third design principle um, is that bit about scrap and specific things and stuff. That's cool. Um, Oh, let's talk about the, the keep watch thing because that's something I haven't really decided on at this point. Um, so I wrote when you keep watch over the safe house, when you keep watch over an area, uh, I'm not sure if I want the move to pull double duty. So um, this is a fiction interrogation move, right? That there's not, that, that it is. It, it's when you keep watch, you interrogate the fiction, but it's also like, um, it's also a good opportunity for uh, economy. Um, it's also a really good opportunity for, for economy, which is, um, uh, I can say things like, um, oh man, you guys are, you are going to see me design a move straight up. So first off, let's do smash, which is what's the best thing that they could get when you keep watch over a safe house. Um, uh, the, Time passes quietly but productively. Uh, what about like instead of quietly? What about we just say the time passes productively, and then we say, um, and again, that's like a really really shitty fictional fictional um, result, right? So um, remember, we have we. I've, I've actually really interesting to to go back to this. 
in our first discussions about moves, we said fictional trigger, mechanical role, fictional result, mechanical result. And I actually am not writing the fictional results yet because for me, the fictional results are defined by the mechanics um, a bit more than the other way around in this phase of move writing, which means that um, the best moves are when they can be both. So you find that specific thing you need is both a fictional re response and the mechanical response in the same thing. Um, but in this version, uh, asking the following questions is kind of both fictional and mechanical. Um, but for example, what I just wrote and what I'll bring us back to, the idea of the time passes productively, like this is this is the worst fictional output I've ever seen, but I'm okay with it as a draft. Like I said, no one's patting me on the head for writing a first draft. So let's just do this. Um, so the time passes productively. So I think I want ask the GM or... Um, uh, maybe I can like, um, maybe I could roll like, you see something interesting, maybe you see something interesting and I could be like, um, roll, uh, okay. Okay. I'm just going to write this down. Then we're going to talk about it afterwards. Cause it's a thing. Um, roll, uh, get news. I'm, I'm just going to call it get news at the moment. Um, but I prefer the fictional trigger I wrote before. Um, when you see, you see something interesting, roll get news. Um, and like, basically that's enough because this is implying that this stuff isn't gonna happen, which it is. Um, uh, 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 I missed something. What do we lose? Um, there's a moment in uh, this war of mine when you come back from scavenging and it's like, Marco was meant to be guarding the safe house, but he's fucking useless. So someone broke in and stole all our pears. And you're like, oh, Marco, I only stole, I only got two pears because I thought we had plenty of pears remaining. And now we don't have any pears today because like the two isn't going to be enough. Like I thought we, I thought this was enough, but now it's not going to be because you fell asleep. You fuckhead. Um, so that is a really cool moment. Like that's something I want to replicate, right? Um, but I need to play that off against a higher, because this is the thing, if this is is too unattractive, because that is unattractive, um, people won't roll this move. So um, who sees me on watch? What opportunity does that provide them? I miss something. What do we lose? Um, uh, I actually quite like that too, these questions having like, Fictional trigger to them. That's interesting. A fictional output to them. Sorry, that's. I might in the future look to that. Um, let's do this. Um, this move has a cool fictional output, um, and I like it because again, complicity. It's the player saying they missed something. It's I missed something. What did we lose? Um, what do we lose? Um, uh, and that's good because it's what do we lose, not what's taken, because what's taken is physical objects, but you can lose opportunities, you can lose a bit of hope, you can lose um, some sleep. Uh, yeah, cool things, cool things. Um, who sees me on watch? What opportunities that provide them? I miss something, what does that lose? What's a third? A th uh, rule of threes for me, yeah. um, I really like having three because um, at least three in my questions, because there's a thing that happens where you go, um, let's write, let's write the third, and then we'll talk about why a third's important. Because I need an example. What opportunities that provide them? I miss something. What do we lose? Um, who joins me out there, um, and what do they ask of me in the quiet? So um, that only works for safe house. Um, doesn't work for keeping watch over an area, really. Uh, okay, we'll talk about it as an example anyway, because remember, these are not good, they're first drafts. So um, who sees me on watch? What opportunity do I provide them? I miss something, what do we lose? Who joins me out there? And what do they ask me in the quiet? Okay. Um, the reason three is important in lists is because we there are two types of decisions that we make. There's toward decisions and away decisions. Um, especially in these lower ones, we're going to look a lot more at away decisions, right? So um, we don't have a lot of resources, so I'm not going to pick 
we miss something, what do we lose? Because I want to keep my resources. So I'm not choosing that one. Now, if I only have two choices, there's that, that's it. They're down to one. They're, they're picking who sees me and watching what opportunities that fry them. And that feels shitty. It feels like you've been forced into it, right? If we say, I miss something out there, what do we lose? And then you go, ah, oh, but I really don't want either of the other two. I definitely don't want that one. So I'll rule that one out. And then I'm picking between the other two. And it still feels like a choice. Um, I mentioned that one of my move uh, writing priorities is no non-choices, right? Um, and it is possible that I turn a move into a non-choice by, especially when I'm doing such fictional, fictionally guided choices. So we'll write our high ones and then we'll, and remember we're going to try and like flip and stuff as well. So this might really, it might help us if we go like one way or the other. So um, who sees me on watch, what opportunities that provide them? Well, what's the easy way to fix that? It's uh, to flip that, sorry. Who do I see and what opportunity does that provide me? Um, then we can say, um, uh, um, I, um, catch something others miss. Um, I don't like that because the whole move is about catching things that others miss. Um, what if we say instead, um, uh, I spot something valuable valuable um what's something valuable to me uh why can't i have it that's maybe like a big weird one but it's like um why what who's got it who's got it that's a good one although that's i'm pretty much asking the same question twice there but i'm i'm okay with that at the moment drafting um by the way, if if y'all if y'all are done, it's probably going to be me writing moves for like the next half hour. So it's two in the morning now. It's probably going to be me writing moves for the next half hour. So don't um don't feel like you got to hang around if you're just here for my bright insight and um YouTube uh, gobbies of people who have written PBTAs before me. Um, okay, here's what I do when I get stuck. So what I do is. When you keep watch over a safe house, roll plus eyes. When you keep watch over an area, roll plus eyes. Um, what move is this like? Uh, it's obviously read a siege, but um, that's a little bit different. Um, but let's look at it, right? So the first thing I do is I normally start... Let's stop this while I'm flicking around. I normally start with Apocalypse World. And then I, I have... Um, uh, just, to, just to show you what I've got. I have like a thing full of RPG... RPGs here, um, and I basically um, just go through and like cartel might have something because cartels about like charge situations and keeping watch and stuff. Um, Bluebeard's Bride isn't going to have what I want. Dogs isn't going to have what I want. Impulse Drive. I haven't. I haven't really. I'm not familiar enough with Impulse Drive at the moment. Um, Monster of the Week won't. I know it doesn't because I've looked at... Oh, Monster of the Week was one of the ones I took those reader person things from. And I know it doesn't have a good reader sitch move. Uh, sorry, not not fair. Not not a fair assessment. Uh, I know it doesn't have a, a reader sitch move that I want to take. Um, the Veil, I don't... I think I think that's just, It's just like it's, a, it's Apocalypse World um, in terms of its moves. The same with the last for the Awful Sea. Um... The Warren, the Warren might have something interesting, right? Because the Warren does interesting things. Uncharted Worlds, we'll have a look through because Sean uh, has approached some things super differently and interestingly. Um, Worldwide Wrestling, I don't think has a... Uh, Worldwide Wrestling, mm, let's just have a look in gimmicks and see if they have a basic move sheet. They don't, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I haven't played World Wide Wrestling and, and it's I'm I'm a little bit conceptually out of it because I'm not a um not a wrestling dude. Okay. Uh playbooks. Nope. Jam materials. Nope. Play kit, maybe? Uh 
Yeah, let's try to play kid. All right, Worlds of Adventure. Yeah, okay, that's what they are. Dope. So, um, y'all are going to come on a ride with me to a world of pure imagination. We're going to go to Apocalypse World. We're going to scroll down to its basic moves. And we're going to go to... And by the way, chat's still open if people think no good... Um, and my Twitter's still open if people know good... Um, uh, reading sitch moves that aren't reader sitch, that are good for, like overlooking the the safe house. Um, when you read a charge situation, roll plus sharp, hit, ask questions. When you act, take plus one. I'm not going to do this. Fuck that. Fuck taking plus one on when you hit. You just get good information. Where's my best escape route? Way in with... I wonder... So this is the thing. If I take this out, I wonder if it's actually going to change how my players engage with it. I don't think it is because no one ever fucking tracks it. No one ever uses it. Every time I've seen read, read a charge situation or read a person, they have wanted the answer. The plus one is just a bonus, and 80% of the time, I see it forgotten. So which enemy is vulnerable? Which enemy is the biggest threat? So again, I'm looking at high moves mostly, so I don't want to look at like ones that are generating leverage for the MC. So which enemy is the biggest threat is generating leverage for the MC mostly. Um, it's not bad, it's not bad, it's not bad, it's not bad. The issue is that um, watching over the safe house should have the opportunity for a quiet night from the high player's perspective, I think. I think, I think, I think. All right, let's look at Cartel. Cartel. So I'm not getting what I want from um, from what's it called? Apocalypse World. Um, let's have a look at Cartel. Size someone up. When you size someone up, ask them questions. What are your current weaknesses? How can I show you dominance? None of them are really... Fuck, I love Confess Your Sins. I have... Um, I, I want to I talk... I don't want to talk about Cartel too much because I am an Australian who doesn't interact with... Uh, and and nor, nor am I a narco-fiction fan. Um, so I don't interact with either the reality or the fiction of what Cartel is trying to talk about. But man, from a design perspective, like some of these are really nice. Um, because... This is exactly what you want players to do. Like, you want them to perform penance to clear stress track, but, like, confessing sins, it, it just fits in the theme really well from what I'm understanding of um, of narco fiction. Uh, I don't like that um, dishing out a beatdown is not integrated to turn to violence because they're looking for different things. I think it's weird. <laughs> Whatever. I think it's weird that um, PBTA moves. I, I don't like... Okay. There's a moment that comes in some PBTA, PBTA moves where you say, um, are you trying to trigger X? And they look at you. The player looks at you and goes, I'm actually trying to trigger Y. And it usually happens like this. Um, we're playing Dungeon World and I say, um, I stand in front of him with my shield and I have my shield axe. I'm a fighter with the laser shield and I have my spear and I like over the top of my shield, stab down at him with a spear. And the GM goes, um, oh, cool. Uh, roll, roll, hack and slash. And I go, I'm actually trying to like defend. Like that's what I'm trying to get across with like the shield and the thing. And the issue with that is that um, the fiction and the, tr the triggers aren't distinct enough fictionally that that doesn't happen. Now, is that a bug? Is that a feature? I can totally understand why people would like that because um, when you when you have that moment in that negotiation, um, it's kind of nice that like people engage with that. Um, but when you um, PBTA is not a game about engaging with that negotiation at the table. It's a game about a conversation, but the conversation has the negotiation built into the moves. Is one of the ideas. Um, so I. I, I'm not a massive fan of two moves being... So this is the thing, right? Like, that... Like, turn to violence should just have a choice that's like, when you turn to violence, you you remove stress. I don't... Anyway. Um, 
Impulse drive, impulse drive handouts. I haven't looked at this sheet before. Um, so let me have a look at moves, basic moves. Impulse drive, extra moves, captain's Richard, comments moves, social moves. Oh, I, I love, I love the idea of impulse drive so much, but holy fucking shit, what is with having a million pages of moves? I want like. I think I want like 10 moves tops, maybe basic moves. Um, holy shit, do I not want this many? So, combat moves, action moves, out quick, keep your cool, Ibis stairs back, motor head, exploration moves. There you go, that's a good one. Um, okay, exploration moves for impulse drive. Um, Scope it out. When you use time or sensitive equipment to close study an object, what happened here recently? What's about to happen? What here will give me an edge? Who's really in control here? What here is not what it appears to be. What happened here recently? What is about to happen? What here will give me an edge? Who's really in control here? What here is not what it appears to be. What happened here recently? Um, mm, that might be a good move to add for this watch over an area bit. So like when you like assess an area, um, like what happened here recently. And then we want to give our plus one here, right? So remember this needs to be attractive. So it's like what happened here recently and what uh, valuables did it did that leave behind um, basically? So we want to say like uh, what happened here recently and and how can I take advantage of that? And that's this question, what opportunities it provide me? So the, um, ask the following questions um, and uh, follow it with, follow it with, uh, and what opportunity does that provide me? Um, because I think that's, I think the thing is we want it to offer leverage, right? So. The difference between who do I see and who do I see and what opportunity does that provide me is a very different question. Um, I spot something valuable to me. Why can't I have it? And what opportunity does that provide me? <laughs> Who's got it? And what opportunity does that provide me actually is is an option. Uh, what happened here recently and what opportunity does that provide me? Uh, is a, I think that's, I think that might be a bit of a linchpin to providing some momentum to this move. It's a bit weird to have it like that, but we'll see if I like it. Um, what ha What is about to happen and what opportunities that provide me? I don't like this one because I feel like this one's about generating leverage for the GM more. Um, what here will give me an edge? I don't really want edges like that. I don't think, I don't think my players generate edges. I think they generate survival. Uh, who's really in control here? Kind of don't care about what here is not what it appears to be. I also don't care about. Um, so swift warning is a is a Warren move, which is um, when you alert others to danger, they take plus one forward. I'll I'll zoom in on this when we actually get to one that works for me. Um, hmm. Hmm. Uh, Interesting. Don Keen, Keenan Dahl. Okay, so maybe we can talk about that. So um, the Warren has these two moves, Sense of Space and Sense of Others, which are actually both really interesting. Um, with Sense of Space, um, you can ask, where can I find this? Or where can I find something? And with Sense of Others, you ask uh, who would know about and use the pay attention move for that. Now, do I have, I don't know if I have the Warren's basic moves just lying around. Um, the Warren, the Warren, there we go. We're also going to look up, oh, that's weird. I've only got the GM sheet and the character playbooks. So I wonder if the character playbooks for the Warren has, ah, it does have basic moves. Pay attention. When you give your full attention, roll plus shrewd on a 10 plus, hold two, seven to nine, hold one, six minus hold one, but open yourself up to danger. Holds maybe spent one for one, name sense, last GM. <laughs> what here is the greatest danger to me? What will happen if I stay very still? Where can I flee to? Are they telling the truth? What do they wish I'd do? How can I get? Okay. Um, good question for me to have. And I think I've already got that integrated enough. 
what do they wish I'd do is a much more a person question than what I'm looking at at the moment. Um, what will happen if I stay very still? That's an interesting one. What will happen if we stay here? What will happen if we stay here? What here is the greatest danger to me? That's, yeah. Mm, I think it's just generating weird uh, leverage for the wrong people in what I want to do. In, in like, um, yeah, it, the, the, the warrant's not a problem, but it's just in what I want to do, common moves, assessment. Ah, uh, that's right. Okay, so um, assessment, when you do it, you just get a data point, which reminds me I don't have the sprawl open. Um, the sprawl, there it is. Um, yeah, okay. With assessment, you get good information, you get a data point. That's actually pretty good research. Where would I find how secure is... Oh, how secure is... Hmm, that's interesting. Hmm. Um, what has been left unguarded? And what opportunity does that provide me? Interesting. Interesting sprawl. Interesting, Hamish. Who or what is related to... I'm not doing that kind of social contact stuff. Who owned or employed? Um, not, not relevant. Who or what is blah most valuable to? Not going to work. What is the relationship between blah and blah? Not going to work. Take so control and see what's your question. Cool. Um, uh, urban shadows, moves, basic moves. I uh, actually think it's drama moves, isn't it? For um, uh, you can figure someone out. I'm not trying to figure someone out though. I'm trying to figure a, a situation out, which isn't really the urban shadows uh, oeuvre, but it might be in here somewhere. Debt moves. I don't think it's in drama moves. Corruption, intimacy. So, my previous thing about who was the first to call it intimacy moves, the answer to that question may well be uh, Andrew Medeiros and Mark Diaz Truman. Uh, wow, okay. Um, this is why I do this because I had no idea. I had no idea that the person that wrote Urban Shadows is the same person who wrote The Watch. Um, and then Anna's in The Watch, or Anna's in The Watch, and uh, Mark D. Struman wrote Cartel. I basically have, um, I basically have like two writers that wrote my entire library. What the fuck am I doing? Um, this is crazy. I'm not, I, I, like, it's, it's great. It's great to see um, authors' names again because they're really, they're obviously really good at what they do. Otherwise, I wouldn't be so interested in stuff. But um, yeah, how interesting. How interesting. Um, okay, so let's go back to this move because we're just going to get it to a place that's sustainable and then we're going to move move away. Um, okay, so now that I've done this, I think I think I might do the same here and follow it with... And what does that cost us? So um, who sees me on watch and what does that cost us? I miss something. And what does that cost us? I miss something during my watch. And what does that cost us? Who, uh, see, now I can... Now I can get rid of that one because I know it doesn't fit. So let's try and flip one of the other ones. So... What has been left unguarded? What does that cost us? Not really. Who do I see? What? Oh, that's interesting. No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I was going to say, what if I had follow up with this and follow up with this and then just had one list of questions? And so the actual thing that 
told you whether the question was good or bad, which is that end tag, and it was the rest of it. The problem is, like, I missed something during my watch. Doesn't um, doesn't work for both. I'd have to change it. It'd have to be something like, um, uh, I get easily distracted, and what opportunity does that provide me? Would be like, um, while you're meant to be looking out over here, you catch a glint, and you look over there, and, like, you're distracted over there, and you see something new, or, like you hear voices from underneath in the safe house and oh, that's not a bad idea. Hmm. All right. Okay. So now we're going to do this. This is, this is how I make moves. And it's, and it's kind of cool is I bring that up. I do this. I do that. And then I say this and this. And I say, ask one of the below questions. And follow it with what question does it, and then ask one of the blow questions and follow it with what does that cost us? And you say, what opportunity does that provide us? And you say, who do I see and what opportunity does that provide? Well, we can get rid of that. Who do I see? And what does that cost us? Um, um, What valuable thing is being moved? Oh boy, do I not like that one. Um, what happened here recently is not bad. What happened here last night? And what does that cost us? What has been left unguarded? And what does that cost us? That'll have to change. That'll have to be like, um, uh, what, movements of soldiers or something? I don't know. I feel like, um, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what it is. Something else I do when I'm, uh, having a bit of a struggle, I go guarded, unguarded, and I just leave that. And it's just a, it's just a placeholder. Who sees me on my watch? Um, and what does that, what opportunity does that provide us? Um, who notices me watching? And what opportunities that provide us? Who notices me watching? And what opportunity? What does that cost us? Um, what distracts me from my? Uh, I don't. I don't want what distracts. Yeah, what distracts me from my watch? And what opportunities that provide us? And what does that cost us? That's interesting. I don't know if I like that, but it's there. Yeah. And then we can just say when you. Watch out when you keep watch. I like, I like, I kind of like keep watch better. You keep because it sounds planned, right? Um, I don't know if I want this or not, but when you keep watch, roll plus eyes. So, uh, um, yeah, the move can pull double duty because it's not just, it's this is, this is, um, keep watch and also. Uh, read a sitch, right? So, which means keeping keeping watch is not a good fictional trigger, right? I need to, I need to fix that. I need to make it more um, read a sitchy, more read a sitchy. Um, you see something interesting? Roll get news. That's kind of shit. Because why not just roll get news to begin? Um, you see something interesting? Um, what if I just do the cheat that I've been doing? which is both ask of the higher list. That's a good cheat, right? It's functional. That's all it is. It's not super attractive. Like it doesn't feel worth it if you hit it that high, um, but it does mean there's no cost, which is interesting. What do I see? What valuable thing is being moved? What happened here last night? Uh, what has been guarded or gar unguarded? Um, what patterns of behavior change? That's, see, that's, that's how we do. That's how we fucking do. That's how we, that's how we edit moves and write and shit. Um, we just go over it. We write trash and then we go over it. Um, how long have I been going? I've been going for a total of two hours. Uh, this is going to wrap soon because I'm getting to the point where I don't think I'm interesting at the moment. That's fine. Um, oh, I want to talk about negotiating trade because it's a move I haven't been out of fix yet. Okay, so when you negotiate a trade, roll plus amount. See, this is this is how much I haven't been out of 
have mana. The issue is I don't like this. This asks someone, it's just a die roll, but it normally implies some sort of leverage. Very one and done, has the same problems as those absolution rolls, right? So uh, this, I said I wanted it monster heart skin that you just don't get it. Pace, I want I want pacing and development, and everyone wants what you want. Everyone needs what you need. They'll roll whatever you have the least of. Um, so what if it's like... <sighs> I really don't know if I just want this to be like read a person. So one, one option for this move is read a person. Um, what will it cost to get blah... And then someone writes, and then the, the answer comes, and then you just do it, right? And that's that's Monster Heartsy. This is this is the Monster Heartsy bit. Um. So in this war of mine, which I should I should stream myself playing that one day. That's not a bad idea. I should stream myself playing it and talking about it. Um, in this war of mine, negotiating trades is a mechanical like mathematical thing where um different people want different things and so they give you a lot for them and you kind of like make like a um like an economy and the, the thing about the economy though is not um it's not like that um what was that flash game we used to play in high school about like drug drug wars or like ma mafia drug or something like that where you'd like basically you travel to different cities and they'd have drugs at different prices and you buy all the cocaine in San Francisco and then you take it to New York and sell all the cocaine um, and you make all the money and you become a drug kingpin um, because that's how it works. That's basically a cartel, honestly, Mark. Like, pff, come on, man. They did it years before. Um, fuck. Um, read a person, what will it cost? When you negotiate a trade, roll plus math. So, so when you negotiate trades in... Um, this war of mine, it's interesting because you want everything, but you need some stuff, right? So the high mechanic, the good, is you get what you want. And the low is it'll cost you what... No, sorry, is the, the high is you get what you need. And the low is it'll cost you what you want. Now, the question is... So I don't think I want people trading for scrap. Like, I don't think I want people buying scrap, right? It's It's not like... This isn't Blades in the Dark where I want you to go and do jobs for coin. I want you to scrounge a lot of time. Maybe, yeah, maybe that's a maybe that's an interesting thing of being like the high person chooses. Hmm. Okay, so let's go back to the text because I'm just going to start smashing things out. Oh, by the way, I have to take my ears out for a sec, but you're going to see. Oh, I got these babies pierced and they're just gorgeous. Oh, they're so lovely. So lovely, but they do hurt at the moment, especially when I have them in a headset forever. Oh, I need to get comfy as shit if I'm going to do this for two and a half hours. Um, okay, so the fictional thing that we're trying to replicate. Um, so let's say genre emulation is um, you want everything need something, right? Now, remember that um, I'm going to have a couple of different economies in this game, but primarily the resources that player is going to have available is going to be scrap, specific items, um, and... Um, Oh man, so one of my ideas with specific items, we, ha we have to talk about this a little bit to talk about the economy. So one of my ideas with specific items is that my I want my advancement to be very compendium classy, which means, oh man, this is, you guys are getting secrets. Everyone else who tuned out after an hour and a half doesn't get these secrets. Um, I want them to be compendium classy. And the way compendium classes work is um, you... <laughs> Thank you. I just, I just saw a chat thing because I flicked my thing over. I thank you, Fictive Fun. I'm not sure who you are, but I love you. Um, so um, uh, I should really leave that window up, shouldn't I? I'll tell you what I'll do. 
I'll bring that down. So I always have my chats up for you people. This is me learning how to stream as much as it is me learning how to design, which is super interesting. Um, so um, negotiating trades. Uh, oh, sorry, companion classes, specific items. So um, what I want to do is I want I want you to have like, uh, let's say like two basic moves. Oh, let's say like you've got five basic moves, right? Your basic moves are share what little you have, scrounge, um, trade, um, and something else. And like get shot and heal wounds. Oh, no, no, get shot, but not heal wounds. So, oh, it's bad. Fuck oh, yeah. Hi, Patrick. Um, so, um, you've got, you've got those. So they, they are five moves. They're not enough, but if you want to make more moves, you have to get more stuff, but you need specific stuff. So the way advancement works isn't, um, when you, when you get XXP, XXP, when you get a certain amount of XP, advancement works like when you have binoculars, you can make the keep watch move. When you have a radio you can listen out for good news. When you um, have something else, it's something else. And what that means is that is that players get to... Um, it means that players get to drive the fiction to getting the moves that they want without having this dumb interplay. I... I, I Kyle, if you listen to this, I love I love you and I really enjoy playing Blades with you. I hate the way Blades does and um and Mr. Harper, if you do listen, I super fucking respect you as a, as a designer. I hate the way Blades does this thing where it says you can buy so you can get authority to buy stuff with advances and you can fictionally get stuff. But it kind of demands that you do both in this really weird way, where it's like, and um, the amount of stuff when we played Blades tonight that like I didn't understand properly um, about the system means that I might be fucking this up as well. Uh, and again, if I am, please someone hit me up. Um, as players, we don't really have the authority to say. Um, we really want turf. So we're just going to do a score where we go get turf, right? Um, because a GM who wants to pace the game and play by the rules and wants to restrict players and push back in the way that they should says, um, no, no, you need an upgrade to purchase turf, right? But then the weird thing is when players get an upgrade and they're like, I just want to buy turf, the GM's like, nah, you got to get it fictionally. And that's, and that's like... I don't like the fact that it makes two demands of players without making those clear, but I really like the idea of fictional demands. Um, have we, we haven't spoken about compendium classes, um, dungeon world compendium classes. Um, and we're only going to talk about this just a little bit, but we're just going to say, yeah, cool, cool, cool. So this is, I just picked one at random off by Googling Dungeon World Compendium classes. But when you capture a strange creature after beating into submission, you may take this move when you level up, which means that you you get to be a monster tamer after you tame a monster. Like, how cool is that? How cool is that as a, as a player that you get better at the stuff that you want to do by doing the stuff that you want to do? And... Um, my dog's PBTA one playbooks. Pick this one. So my dog's PBTA had stuff like um, when you, uh, if you've helped another recover from their wounds, you can spend an advance to lay hands upon the dying. Um, if you have offered mercy where it was not deserved, you may spend an advance to take the following move after taking on another's burdens. Right now, the cool thing about this to me is that it makes players drive their game in a certain direction, um, which makes me really happy. Um, if you've kept a promise at a cost to yourself, you may spend an advance to take the following move, which means that players that want this move are going to start making promises at cost to themselves, and they're going to keep them. And that that is really cool. So 
specific items, that's what they're going to be. They're going to be specific items are basically going to be authority for moves. Um, so scrap specific items and like, um, I think maybe like time weariness, uh, something like that, right? Like, so when you negotiate a trade um, on a smash, um, uh, it'll cost a fair amount of scrap. Um, on a high, um, we say, um, so high is like choose one, low is choose one. And maybe it doesn't need to be like, maybe, maybe high, you can just be like, no, because this is more social. So there are some moves where you're allowed to say, um, high is this and low is this. And those moves will be mostly stuff like, um, when you tend to wounds, right? So when you when you and a friend tend to, or even um, a move like, uh, yeah, there's like you know when you when you when you for just a moment are able to forget the war, reduce your weariness on a high. That's because um, you are getting a benefit, right? But if it was like um, when you and a friend share a story before the war, war uh, high equals. Um, uh, the world is softer. That feels really unsatisfying because you're you're not getting involved, right? Like it's not. It need you. It needs to matter that I rolled high and you didn't. So it's not just like um, world's darker. In this case, it doesn't matter who rolls high and low, and therefore it's not making best use of the mechanic. So back up to negotiating a trade. Uh, and in fact, we're gonna take strike a trade and bring that up as well, because it's basically me writing the same move twice, trying to figure it out the second time. Um, this was a, now this is, this, is, this is a good thing, right? The price is a little higher or more specific, they choose. So low, you choose one. Um, uh, you can offer a little extra scrap and for thing it's um, you can offer something specific and valuable. And this is, I'm not sure if I'm going to make this like protected word, um, but I might. So um, protected words, um, as far as I understand them, and I'm not an editor and stuff like that, is stuff like um, instead of s uh, a specific item, we have um, a specific item. Um, you know what's a good example of a, of a protected word? Where's Apocalypse World? See how charged is in bold here? Charge is a protected word. Charged means something in this. In this. Um, you know what another? Good protected word is um, harm. Where's harm? Like is yeah. So like harm means something. It's not. It's not when you get hurt, right? Suffering harm means mechanically you tick off one of your harm boxes. So it's a yeah. So um, am I saying you can offer something specific and valuable, or like? Um, and by the way, do I want, I kind of want to cross the line here a little bit. I kind of want to say, say like, um, choose one. Uh, I, I really want to say, what I really want to say is they ask for something specific. So maybe, maybe I'll say like, choose one. Or maybe I'll say um, here, they ask for something specific. Um, and then choose one. Give them what they're after, or um, offer some extra scrap instead. Uh, offer instead of some extra, I'll say um, an equivalent amount. Oh god, that's insane. god damn! If I sat down at a game and the fucking designer thought it was appropriate to write the words equivalent amount, I would. I would punch out. I would literally leave the game. I'd be like, this guy doesn't know how to uh, 
had to roll, had a had a had a play game. Uh, so um, they've got something. Choose one, and I'll say, um, do you think it it'll? Um, you think it's close, um, but it'll do. Um, and you think uh, it's fuck, but you can fix it. I do that. I need to write a fix it move, and I don't know if I want to write a fix it move. Um, oh, that'd be interesting. What if I did that, and then I had a tool bench that was a specific item? Um, like a tool bench, right? That's a specific item. And then that has a move that lets you fix shit. So the benefit is that when shit gets broken or when you get this, you you get, oh, fuck, that's... Um, uh, uh, you won't get it, but you can get something close. I don't like that either. It's this, this one approaches the line real hard because what I actually want to say, the actual words that I want to say, uh, they don't have it, but they have something close, um, which is... Oh, I can just do the same thing I did with the low roll, right? So I can just say, um, they don't have it. Exactly. They don't have it. Ex uh, that should be, the, brand, the ellipsis should be back here. They don't have it exactly. Choose one. Um, you think it's, uh, uh, it's fucked, but you can fix it. That's. Even though it doesn't start with the right pronoun, it um, still doesn't cross the line, I don't think. Um, and this is like, uh, you can do something with what, the, what, what they're offering. And so it's like, when you negotiate a trade, um, this is actually more like um, when you seek out something specific. Um, us, it's not. It's not. I don't really want a thing where. Um, <laughs> oh, specific tools could lead to exploring specific locations. That fucking co-writing credit, my dude. Oh, that's awesome. This is why you design in front of people because they give you good ideas. Um, so you can do something with what they're offering. So the issue is, so here's, here's my question is, do I want when you get a job for some scrap, basically, do I want to turn this into blades in the war? Do I want this, do I want this to be a game where people so trader i don't know if that came across the mic trader knocks on the door you answer hey mate what's going on he says hey i heard that you guys are low on scrap i've got a job for you now that's that goes two ways and and i have feelings about both ways one it's super quest givery which is a bit two um it's kind of interesting because it's someone in the community bringing a problem to you. Um, three, it has a very different feel mechanically to a specific trade. Um, and it also relieves a lot of the economic pressure on players, right? So if someone says, hey, look, uh, old old fuck nuts who's, who's hi um, hiding in the police station, he has taken my... Uh, my, the, the, my photo album, my family photo album, it's, it's the last thing I had with me. Um, I want you to go and um, take it back from him and I'll give you some food and shit, right? Like I'll give you food and shit, equivalent scrap. Um, that, it, I don't think I have moves that let people do that. I don't think I have moves that let you sneak in to his place and scrounge and stuff like that, right? I mean, I guess I do. Like, I've got scrounge for stuff. Um, especially if you're looking for something specific. <sighs> Maybe. You know what? Maybe 
maybe this is something worth leaving in and then just seeing what how it plays out at the table. Uh, this is, I don't think this is a decision. There are a couple of different decisions that you can make. Some of them are decisions you can make in design and some of them are decisions you can make in play. Um, I'm having a, I have a theory I'm working on at the moment, which is that we don't design games, we design systems and we write settings. And then um, games is what happens when people play them. Uh, and I don't think this is a decision I can make at a system level. I think it's only a decision I can make at play level. So let's let's just fucking roll on. Let's just do it. Let's just keep keep writing moves, man. So um, these can all kind of work. Um, negotiate a trade works a bit better than um, so smash. It'll cost me a fair amount of scrap needs to change. Um, you can cut a fair price. Um, the GM will tell you what. Um, still don't like this, um, but it's better than nothing. Uh, maybe it's um, they've got what you need, and you can cut a fair price. And we'll tell you what. Um, maybe that's maybe that's good enough. Um, it does get into this problem. That's like so you go into the police station and you see Captain Fucknuts. Uh, I don't know why he's Captain now. Captain Fucknuts. And you say, "Oi, oi, fucko! I, we know you've got a a, a um, thing, a, a, a um, photo album, and we want it back. All right, roll." They've got what you need and you can cut a fair price to Jim, we'll tell you what. And he'll probably be like, oh, well, obviously you want it more than me, so it's probably going to cost you more scrap. And you're like, fuck. Because the only thing you can do is scrounge, which you can't do if he's there, so you need to take him out, but you can't use violence because you're not... This isn't about violence, it's about like sneaking around people, but I don't want to do a sneaking around move either. So like, oh, this fucking quest is like changing the game. This is... We're going to talk about this another day, but this is a phasic problem. This is about whether I'm designing Dungeon World or the Campfire Hack. This is about whether I'm designing um, Flying Circus or Night Witches. Uh, and I don't know yet which one I'm making. So whatever. It's it's what it is now. Um, they don't have it exactly, but choose one. Maybe that's why you wouldn't do it because they don't have it exactly. You can do something with what they're offering. It's fucked, but you can fix it. Maybe you can do something with what they're offering could include... Um, uh like they know who has it because that's if you're looking for something specific you can do something with what they're offering he might be like look i can tell you who's got one and how to get one if you want if you want a photo album i can tell you how to get one um they don't have to exactly choose one it's fucked but you can fix it i like that especially because i like this bad my boy uh low that's something specific choose one you give them what they're after which is something specific, which you probably don't want to do, or you offer an equivalent amount of scrap instead. Which, if you get into this trade thing, if you get into this, uh, not trade, into the into the job, get a job thing, this falls apart at the moment. Okay, so we kind of designed this this move bottom to top, and we've gotten to the top, and it's and we've come up with a new idea for it, but now we're going down to the bottom, and the bottom's not working now because we've changed our intent. So, um. Ask for something specific, choose one. Give them what they're after. Offer an equivalent amount of scrap instead. What else? What else? When you get a job for some scrap, roll plus mouth, you get a job. So let's talk about genre emulation, right? So let's go back to genre emulation, which is people want things done. I'll pay you to do them, right? Now, the complications, we're talking about complications. So the complications from that one can be they're not paying you enough. They're asking too much. I wonder if there's like this something then that you they're not telling you. Is that maybe something like um, is something they're not telling you? Um, what would that be if you got something from them though? There's something they're not telling you. The radio is bugged, but I like that's that's a one trick pony. You're not going to pull that again. The workbench is bugged. The bed's bugged. Huh, bed bugs. Um, fuck it. It's 2.42. I'm going to have to roll this up in 15 minutes. Um, so one of my resources, screen stream, some items, and time weariness.
I can do weariness. Like, you wear them down, increase your weariness, but that feels shitty. Um, <clears throat> all right. Let me let me think this out. Let me think. This will be my last move. So let me think this out. Um, I am, <clears throat> I'm a, I'm a player. Knocks on the door. We both go together. We negotiate the trade. Um, on a lower roll, <clears throat> they ask for a specific thing. That's a good cost. Um, they ask for something specific. I like that cost. Choose one. Hey, mate. Um, fuck nuts has stolen my photo album. I need you to go get it back. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. They ask for something specific. Um, great. Bring it to me here. Oh, what if it's like they don't have it with them? Mm, interesting. Interesting. Um, they don't have it with them. The problem with they don't have it with them, because the idea is leaving your safe house is a dangerous thing, right? So if someone comes to your door and it's like, yeah, okay, cool, cool. Um, the problem with that is uh, two problems. They don't have it with them aligns with you can do something with what they're offering, which is also kind of they know who has it. And they don't have it with them um, is, is a problem here because that fictionally doesn't line up, right? So I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Um, how, what are we going to do instead? So uh, offer an equivalent amount of scrap instead. Give them what they're after. Um, okay, again, knock, knock. Let's do a different scenario this time. So, uh, baby, someone stole my, oh, my flute. Someone stole my flute. Okay, where's your flute? I left it in this house and then the soldiers moved in and they've taken it up as a sniper nest. And now I'm really concerned because of my flute. Okay, we're going to get your flute. Great. They asked for something specific. Um, well, I think like where its location is or something like that. Like they, they asked something specific. Like, great, it's, it's in this location or like you need to do this or, you know, yeah, it's... It's problematic. Basically, they are saying specific is ba is basically saying it's it's a problematic uh, job. Um, choose one. You promise to give them what they're after, which is fine because you've already increased the complications of it. Um, offer an equivalent amount of scrap instead. Um, it's kind of see that's a non-choice. This doesn't work. This doesn't work as a job for some scrap because you can't have the scrap economy being tied into the scrap economy, um, which is fine. I don't mind this. So I mentioned before that um, I don't want, I don't want to have just two choices because if you choose away from one, you are stuck with the other one. Um, so am I okay with this being um, when you negotiate? A trade. They've got exactly what you need. You can cut a fair price GMLT white. They don't have it exactly. Choose one. You can do something with what they're offering. They know who has it. It's fucked, but you can fix it. Tool bench, which I like. They ask for something specific. Choose one. Give them what they're after. Offer an equivalent amount of scrap instead. Missed an MC move. Um... Do I need third options? Okay, I'm a player. We're low on scrap. Yeah, I want the radio. Shit, we can't give up scrap. We also can't give up the radio. They're going to be like, I want to negotiate. You can't. You've rolled to negotiate. That's what you got. Um, give them what they're after. Offer an equivalent amount of scrap instead. Um, I wonder if there's like a promise to pay them later thing about like... Uh, promise to pay them later and then we can have like um the uh blades crime boss mechanic where like after you get paid they take it back so it's like this basically um is gm leverage right gm leverage uh for a bigger move later um is basically what that is i'm not sure if i like that 
Um, and for this one, you can do something with what they're offering. Um, I, th I think the only thing I'd do is I would split this out. So I'd be like, um, I don't have exactly, but um, someone does and you get the name. And you know who, and you know who. Um, so I've just, all I've done here is split that out into two. Um, I think that's actually worse design. I think it's better when it's brief, but it's causing the problem at the moment with this. It's, yeah, this high roll isn't super attractive. That's the problem. This This high roll is not that attractive. Maybe it's fucked, but you can fix it. Should move into here. Um, but then that doesn't tie into that fictionally. And then they got it. They got it and choose one. Uh, and choose one. Um, what if we say the price isn't incredibly specific? And the price, shit, 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 shit. I'm doing a bad, I'm doing a bad, I hate doing this. I hate it when I do this. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to do this because we're going to make a big structural change to the move. Negotiate a change. They got it. Um, you can do something with what they're offering. He's going to change to... Um, you don't have to pay them something specific. Um, and we're going to change this to you don't have to give up. Um, low is going to be, um, well, very perfect. And it's going to say, um, it's fucked, but you can fix it. Um, and we're going to say, um, not exactly what you asked for. You can make it work. Um, that's an interesting way. And then what about, what did I say about? about this, about they knew who has it, promise to pay them later. No. Why the fuck did I switch those? I'm sure I had a reason. God damn, I'm going to need to watch this video to figure out why I switched those. Um, they got it, choose one. Oh, it was because I got rid of that. It's because I wanted to make that high feel like a success. Yeah, okay. So this is this is a really good example of PBTA moves uh, and how it's in the presentation. Um, PBTA is almost always a presentation thing. Um, very so uh we talk a lot about like evocative layer and then and then our play layer or mechanical layer and often the problem is engaging with it at that at that evocative layer and the difference is um uh i'm i'm actually going to tell a story that is told a lot um and is a little bit lame for me to tell because it's not my story um i can't remember where i first saw it i think it was on like a cracked article or something like that but originally um uh, World of Warcraft, the rest XP used to be called an XP penalty. So you'd get, you'd have a level and a half. And then after you got that, you would get penalized minus 100 XP. So you're uh, minus 50% XP. And people fucking hated it, man. People rebelled against it. And then they changed it to when you rest, when you stop playing and rest, you get 200% XP bonus. It's the same, it's the same mechanical calculation, but the way they changed it changed people's perception of it so it was a bonus instead of a um instead of a, a negative and it's it's called anchoring and you see it in sales all the time where people are like um this dress is 105 dollars big line through it only 35 dollars and whether or not you think that dress is worth 35 dollars you will artificially inflate its value in your mind because of that original anchored price point so in Blades, we need to sell the high roll as a success. And the difference here is a high roll 
you don't is this this basically says you don't get what you want. This says you get what you want. Edit. Choose one. You don't have to pay them something specific. You don't have to give up a ton of scrap. Great. Low. Well, it ain't perfect. Um, maybe that should be any scrap because you're not picking. A, if you pick, you don't want to give up something specific, then it'll cost you scrap and the GM will tell you what that is. Uh, and it ain't perfect because it's far. So you basically, on a high roll, you get this, but you get this, you get the smash result, but you get the low. Um, which is great. I'm okay with that. I normally want my smashes to be a little bit better, but there are some points where I'm like, eh. Um, you don't have to give up a, an unreasonable amount of scrap. Is that you get it, but it's a, the price is a little bit inflated. An inflated amount of scrap, maybe. Um, make it sound like a success. Give GM authority to make the smash better. Or maybe the smash should just be better. Um, which is, uh, and you can cut a more than fair price, a more than fair price. It means that um, I'm not actually changing this. Uh, I'm giving up any scrap. Um, I'm not. I'm not changing this. I'm changing. Oh, sorry, I'm not changing this. I'm changing this. So um, when I want to make the gap between my high and my smash bigger, I just increase my smash rather than changing my high, rather than reducing my high. Um, authority. Well, it ain't perfect, but choose one. It's fucked, but you can fix it. It's not exactly what you asked for, but you can make it work. I don't really like this one because if you're getting something specific, it the game is going to say. So the game is going to say like, knock you Lars, do this bino move. And the problem is if it's not exactly what you asked for, but you can make it work, it's basically saying you can make the move anyway. So what's the fucking problem? So um, maybe it's going to be like, so I don't like that one. I don't like enough of me to take away. Um, it'll last for now. It's probably a pretty good one. And um, it, uh definitely belongs to someone. Um like uh fell off the back of a truck. And that is um deferred authority again, right? So this is um deferred authority of GM move. Is leverage, right? You the GM basically says piss someone else off. So do you want a problem now? Do you want a problem later? Or do you want a, do you want a problem with the equipment now? Do you want a problem with the equipment later? Or do you want a problem with people later? So that's a good three. I think that's a good three. You get it. Choose one. You don't have to pay them something. You don't have to give them something specific. You don't have to give up any scrap. Um, what else can I add here? I want to be like... Um, what else? I want one more high high run, which is like, you don't have to give them anything specific. You don't have to give up any scrap. Um, it's a I want like it's a it's a it's a it's a good motherfucker or something like that. Um, mm, it's pretty. It's pretty. Um, mm, mm, definitely not. It's pretty, but something like that. I want like. I want an advantage. I want. I want like it offers you an advantage, or like they throw in some. If, maybe they throw in some information for free, right? They throw in information for free. Uh, ask one from the get news list, right? So remember, I was talking about moves. Firing off moves makes me happy. Um, even if it's just ask one from the get news list, what that does is it stops me writing another list and it means i can just be like oh well uh, uh uh what nearby is useful available to me what's really going on here what should i be on the lookout for what's my best way out way in three three um these are not good these are not as good as i thought they were hmm interesting 
we will spend some time writing those. Um, maybe just ask the GM a question. Maybe ask one of these questions. Um, I kind of like the idea of asking a question, asking a free question, um, with the restrictions being on failed questions. Um, no, no, I promised this was going to be the only, the, my last move so that I could go to bed. It's three in the morning. Um, um, cool. So what we've done with this move that I really, really like is with this move that I really like is high feels like a success. Low feels like a success with cost. That's an immediate problem. That's a later problem. That's a later problem, which is nice. Um, uh, um, it's duct tape and uh, duct tape and twine. Um, big scene, basically. Um, cool. All right. Let's let's call that. Let's call it that. Now. Uh, I got a lot out of this. I, I actually got a big kick out of this. What I might do is I might make... Um, so this is episode six. I might make Drawing the Owl 6.5 and just have it be... Or like six, 6A, maybe 6B, um, and just have it be like me doing more move stuff because I'm getting a lot out of um, two, two parts of this. One is speaking out loud and the other is Pat and Workbench ideas um, feeding in really well, which is awesome. So I'm getting a big kick out of out of doing it this way, but I also understand that some people don't watch this for two and a half hours of me fumbling with moves. Uh, I get that, and I support that decision making um, process. So um, what I might do is, yeah, six B will just be more move creation, and will probably be a similar length because it's fun. And uh, seven, at the moment, I really want to talk about either advancement or phasic games, because I think we're going to have to talk about phase. And we also need to talk about stats sometime. So um, I made a list of things that I actually want to talk about as... Uh, actually, why don't, why don't we do it this way? Why don't, instead of, instead of doing what I want, why don't we talk about what... Um, about what interests you guys. So drawing the owl, forge this wall, here we go. Let me pull up my Google Doc of the running um, thing and I'll go all the way down to the end where I say episode ideas. Um, okay, episode ideas. Um, advancement, history, bonds and links. How do I want to build entanglements? I don't think, I think I've covered Histories, bonds, and links in this game. I don't think I'm going to do a social stat. I think that's pretty obvious. So advancement, compendium, corruption, that sort of stuff, cyberware, all that cool stuff. Um, move, snowball, That. what does that mean from a system and a planning perspective? That could be interesting. Talking about basically what I've been talking about here with leverage and how I need to make sure moves generate fiction on their own. Um, the world ends behind the... Oh, harm and healing. Okay, so I think... I think my choices for, for the next episode, for episode seven, is phasic games, so games with phases, um, harm and healing, advancement, or stats. Harm and healing is probably enough that I'm going to fit it in 6.5, just talking about the harm moves that I make in this game. Um, instead of harm and healing, we're going to say pacing. Pace, um, so pacing resources. So it's, um, I don't want to talk about that yet because it's too much. So the three are um, XP and advancement, um, phasic games or stats. I'll have a think about it. You tell me what you want to hear about next and uh, we'll do that after. I, um, after I do some more moves and uh, in the future, hopefully I'm hoping to have some designers on to talk about this kind of stuff and talk about their struggles and stuff. Um, thank you for your company. Thank you for joining me. Um, and the last, if you, if you made it through the whole length of this, I'm absolutely over the moon. And like, I just, I just can't express uh, at three in the morning, how much I do love you and how much, um, 
your time and your consideration, like I know how valuable your time is and to spend that time with me, uh, especially on something that is so at the moment, like doing this move thing is so valuable to me and probably less valuable to you means the world to me. Uh, so I really appreciate it. And um, the best advice I can give you from today is just get out there and write stuff down. Just start. You'll 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 lose stuff. You'll make you'll make danger zone and it'll go nowhere. And then you'll steal the the mechanic for a later game, or you'll make docs PPTA and it'll go nowhere. And then you'll steal the mechanic for a later game, or you'll write something down and be like, oh, it doesn't work. And then three moves later, it'll click, and the the interactions will all work together. I re- just please just just keep drawing the owl. That's it. Like just pen to paper and just. Just keep drawing. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day.